uh, we're so happy to have everybody back here in person. Um, this is uh, the culminating event of our year-long Veterans Advanced Energy Fellowship, uh, which aims to recognize and celebrate the important contributions that military veterans and spouses are making to the energy transition that is making our country safer, more resilient, and frankly, more independent. Uh, three words which could never be more important uh, given the times we see ourselves in today. Uh, we're glad to welcome uh, those Bay Fellows from around the world here today. Uh, many of them are seeing them meeting in person for the first time as well. So it's just good to kind of be back to something of a new normal, even though we're also streaming online for a, a pretty good sized hybrid audience as well. Uh, over the course of the next few hours, we have an exciting lineup of panels and networking events. Um, and I mean, uh, there's a lot to say right now about climate advanced energy uh, and the role of, uh, you know, building an energy transition that is sustainable and secure. Um, to that end, just a few logistical notes. I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, particularly uh, NRDC, National Grid, Invenergy, and Deloitte, who also generously allowed us to be in their building today. Um, and I'd also like to recognize uh, all of our other sponsors and partners who made this event possible. Um, just a reminder, today's event will be public and on the record, we're going to be live streaming, so don't say anything you don't want to live on the internet forever. Uh, for those of you who are in person, we're gonna be doing in-person audience questions during our panel, so to the extent that you're interested, we have one mic stand, so raise your hand, head to the mic stand and ask your question. If you're watching virtually and joining us on Zoom, uh, you can ask questions through the Q&A function. Unfortunately, if you're watching on Twitter or YouTube or any other streaming service, uh, we won't be able to take your questions. Um, I'd also like to thank a few of our key staff who you know, were really uh, irreplaceable in terms of pulling this off. Katie Kenny, uh, Lauren Holland, uh, Zachary Terrence, uh, Will Tobin, Maya Sparkman, uh, as well as uh, Rebecca Meacham Nance, Graham McGillivray, and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but most importantly, I wanna thank Dan and Greg here, who are our co-directors of the Veterans Advanced Energy Program at the Atlantic Council. Uh, they put in an incredible amount of work into pulling this off and bringing you all here together. Uh, they do it because they feel passionately about the role that uh, veterans play in this subject. Uh, they feel passionately about the impact that you all can have in terms of moving the energy transition forward. And because of that, I'm gonna quiet down and let them do the rest of the talking. So thank you, look forward to speaking to you the rest of the day. When I, when I got out of the Navy, I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was a very tough transition. A year without work, used up all my savings, wandered aimlessly. And now working in clean energy for Invenergy has given me a new mission to you know, contribute to something greater than myself. The reason that I started the Veterans Advanced Energy Project was so that other people could find that same success in meaningful and sustainable employment. That remains our goal today, and I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. We are building a community that understands the importance of our energy security to national security. I'm hoping that you learn something new today, but I'm also hoping that you make a new connection, whether that could be your next job, hiring somebody else, a business opportunity, uh, a, a new connection, or just catching up with new friends. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're all here, to learn and to network. It was my network of veterans that helped me find success to where I am today, and ultimately what we're trying to do here. I hope that you enjoy today's sessions. The morning is gonna be focused more high-level policy, and in the afternoon we're gonna look more to the veteran perspectives. Uh, I'm also happy if you'll notice we have representation from the Departments of State, Energy, Veteran Affairs, and Defense throughout the day. Before I pass the mic, just a couple of notes. Uh, on the table, you'll see a QR code for the conference app if you haven't downloaded it already. That's one way that you can see the agenda, the speakers, other participants to connect. Uh, you can provide your resume that's gonna go to all of our recruiters and our sponsors. You can also look for job postings there uh, and find more information about next the fellowship, the next cohort. Uh, across the hall, past the breakfast bar, is the Sponsors and Recruiters Lounge, so please, that is for all of you to use. It is our space uh, to network and meet with uh, the recruiters and the sponsors who are here, so please
please don't hesitate to go in there. If no one goes, if, if there has to be one person to start or else no one is going to use it, so please do. Uh, and then also you'll notice that there are topics around the tables here. Those are intentional so that you can sit with people who you know already have some interests in mind to help start up the conversation. So feel free in between sessions if you want to shift around and, and make sure you're seated next to some like-minded people. That's there for you. So thank you very much. I've got Thanks, Dan. Dan. Dan Mish is the heart and soul of the Veterans Advanced Energy Project. Dan Mish founded the Veterans Advanced Energy Project after he won an Atlanta Council contest for the best startup idea in clean energy. And that's how I got to know Dan. Um, you mean the world of this program and all the veterans and military spouses that are captured. Global Energy Center, we wouldn't exist without the Atlanta Council Global Energy Center. It is not only our higher headquarters, it's our life support system. And so all the flash and bang that you see around the room and throughout this floor, thanks to Deloitte, we have a floor, appreciate that. These guys can put on an event like there's no tomorrow and they are just a wonderful, wonderful higher headquarters uh, with a lot of people who really care about all of you. Um, I got to tell you, that's a COVID picture there. <laughs> that's a COVID haircut from my 15-year-old son that was payback from the bowl cuts that I gave him growing up. That right there, that's, that was a payback cut. And that's I, I keep. It brings back a lot of memories. So the way you judge your success in Washington, D.C., for those who live in the, the, the Beltway, is the people answer your phone calls at least one of them. People didn't used to answer my phone calls when I called them about the Veterans Advanced Energy Project, what, five, six years ago when we were first kicking this off. People are answering my phone calls now. So something's changed. You know, back when I was commanding officer of Marine Corps Recruit Depot Paris Island, a, a lovely vacation spot out in the Atlantic, some of you may have passed through for about 13 weeks, met a few sand flies along the way. My base commander house would have been under 15 feet of water in the event that a cat one hit at high tide. 15 feet of water. I had to evacuate the installation three times over the course of a two and a half year tour. And yet we haven't divested it. That and the problems have only gotten worse. Not only have the, you know, the, the, the rising water problems, the hurricane alley problems, but the heat problems. Can you imagine trying to train U.S. Marines when every other day is a black flag day? And that's the lifeblood of our Marine Corps, lifeblood of our services. So when we talk about one of the issues we're going to discuss today, the national security implications of climate change, this is real. Not only in terms of what's going on overseas, but what's, what's going on here domestically. This couldn't be a more apropos time for this event today. I mean, goodness gracious, the congressman, I'm certain, will address the Inflation Reduction Act that is going to fundamentally change the complexion of our industry. I commend all of you for being highly strategic and being at the right place at the right time in terms of advanced energy and clean energy. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce Julia Piper and Congressman Raja to talk more about what's going on in Washington in support of our purpose. All right, hello everybody. I'm Julia Piper. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Communications at Good Leap. We are a clean energy financing company. I also host a podcast called Political Climate. Had to give that a shout out. And I'm lucky to be a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And of course, we're joined by Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy today. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank I know you. you have no, you're not very busy right now, I reckon. <laughs> so um, in the interest of time, so I know you have to rush, I'll quickly do a brief bio for the Congressman. He represents the 8th District of Illinois, including Chicago's West and Northwest suburbs. He serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He also served on the Committee for Oversight and Reform, co-chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus on Immigration, uh, Immigration Task Force an assistant whip for the Democratic Caucus. We could go on and on here, but I will leave it there for now to get into the conversation. Sure. So we gotta jump into the news of the day, the Inflation Reduction Act. We just saw that pass in the Senate. I think we have a bit of whiplash, wondering <laughs> what was gonna happen there. 
Um, there's a lot in the $750 billion bill. When you think about it, what is the leading, the headline in your mind? What do you want people to know about this package right now? Um, it's an amazing package. I'll just, I'll just outline some of the main points. Um, it basically, uh, the headline uh, for this conference is basically, it really tackles climate change in a significant way. It's the biggest investment we've ever made uh, to try to lower carbon emissions for the country. On top of that, um, there are provisions to lower prescription drug prices, provisions to lower premiums for purchasing insurance on the Obamacare exchanges, and then uh, provisions to lower the deficit by $300 billion, our cumulative debt over 10 years. And um, over time, it uh, helps to control inflation. So those are the big headlines, but obviously tackling climate change is perhaps the most uh, timely and relevant for this audience. It's interesting to me that that package started so large with a lot of, with a lot of social programs, and we kind of saw climate and clean energy become the bedrock of it at the end of the day. Why do you think that is? Why do you think Congress decided now was the time to make that a centerpiece of this reconciliation deal? I think we're running out of time. I think, I think everyone felt that the clock is running, uh, not only in terms of, you know, are we really going to control thermal man management of the planet, uh, but also the calendar. The election calendar is upon us, and so we have to figure out, okay, what is doable and what can we do quickly? Um, and you find that Venn diagram and we landed on this spot. And so I'm really proud that this week uh, we're gonna, uh, you know, fingers and toes all crossed. Uh, it'll pass the house and then it'll get signed into law and away we go. And so just for everyone's timeline setting, is the vote expected Friday, is that what we're hearing? That's right, um, and I think that, um, there's a chance uh, we might even accelerate that a little bit, but no later than Friday. Got it, and for our purposes, you know, 300 and roughly $70 billion in there for climate and clean energy programs. Is there anything you'd single out there uh, for, for maybe the veterans community and the job growth that we can expect to see in these emerging and growing clean energy sectors? Well, I'm, I'm uh, founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan Solar Caucus in Congress, so I'm very focused on those provisions in particular, but these really apply to all sources of clean energy uh, for the most part. The way I think about it, and obviously uh, all of you are probably going to be unpacking this and learning about the more technical details uh, over the coming weeks as regulations come out uh, to actually uh, give meat to all the provisions of the law. But the way I think about it is essentially there are a lot of uh, tax credits in place for the manufacturing of components uh, with regard to solar panels, for instance, or wind turbines, or even clean hydrogen. Uh, then there's going to be tax credits for developers of projects that employ those particular technologies for the production of clean energy. And then finally, tax credits for the consumers, right. both residential as well as businesses who decide to buy that clean energy. So you're really talking about trying to incentivize all parts of the value chain, so to speak. And so you can imagine there's gonna be tremendous uh, prosperity and a lot of jobs created at every single piece of that chain. I'm personally very excited about the 30% tax credit for solar, yeah. um, especially for, for homes, which kicks in this year. That means you can benefit immediately. We talk about when will this bill have impact. It actually, if passes, would affect people in 2022. That's right. Which is interesting to think about. Um, and and that's, by the way, that's, that's layered on top of all the other incentives that different states, like Illinois, have already put in place for the production of, uh, or investment into solar panels, for instance. And so it's really exciting. We're finally reaching an inflection point where there's going to be so many incentives for buying solar panels and uh, really getting into the clean energy game that I think people will not be able to resist doing so. Yeah, I mean, it also has national security implications, right? I, I saw that the Netherlands just um, announced that they want to switch entirely to heat pumps, so electric heating and cooling systems to reduce their reliance on Russian gas. In this bill, there's lots of funding and, and, and rebates and, and tax credits for heat pumps, which sounds obscure and small, <laughs> yeah. but it, it has national security implications. Huge. But I, I do want to ask about the timeline of that, because we are in this moment of an energy crisis globally in the wake of the Russian war in Ukraine. Will a bill like this have a real impact on that situation, because we're looking at this winter and this bill will take months and years to roll out. So how does that align in your mind? I think, um, uh, well, substantively, 
you know, the implementation of this could be rather rapid, depending on how quickly the Department of Energy and other d different departments uh, issue regulations. So the message from people like me will be, it's time to hustle. We gotta do this quickly. Uh, but, and, the, and then symbolically, I think there are a lot of signals mm -hmm. that are gonna be sent to the markets uh, in terms of um, both buyers and investors getting in mm -hmm. and, and taking advantage of uh, as many of these technologies as possible right now because they know that it's going to be very uh, lucrative down the line as well. It struck me that this is being- So if I, if, I might, if I might kind of flesh that out, mm -hmm. um, if you could imagine someone deciding, ah, should, I, should I invest in um, you know, a clean energy project right now? Or should I stock up on inventory of these solar panels right now because I don't really know whether they're gonna sell in six months? Well, the idea is, yeah, they're gonna sell like hotcakes in six months. So go ahead and do that right now and hopefully that will also lead to more sales right now. Absolutely. I mean, that's what's unique and amazing about this bill is it's 10 years of certainty, which has never really existed right. in U.S. Right. policy before. So we had to take a moment to appreciate that and the investments that can stem from it. Right. And I, I was going to say it reads to me as much as industrial policy as it does a climate policy. Despite the headlines right. we see, you know, the domestic manufacturing piece you pointed to, that is, you know, strategy for decades to come in this nation. Oh, totally. So I, so myself, um, Senator Ossoff uh, and Dan Kildee of Michigan, uh, we are the original co-sponsors of the SEMA, uh, which is basically the Solar Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit, uh, it's a, it's a series of tax credits. Basically, here's the deal, guys, which is that today, unfortunately, most of the components, if you want to install solar panels, come from abroad, okay? Um, and uh, we believe, and, and as a chair of the Solar Caucus, I believe that we should try to keep tariffs as low as possible on as many of these components except for the ones in China, made in China, uh, made in the People's Republic of China, uh, and we can talk about that more later, but um, except for those, we should keep tariffs as low as possible on components coming from the rest of the world, but at the same time, we have to invest in indigenous, American-made components long-term. And so that's why this particular piece of the um, Inflation Reduction Act um, is so exciting because you know, we're gonna have made in the USA components finally over the next five to 10 years, and that's incredibly exciting, especially for developers who are just looking for those sources but aren't able to find them right now. Well, speaking of that, also what passed recently is the CHIPS uh, and CHIPS Science and Science Act. Um, so that would invest roughly $200 billion over five years into US made semiconductor, semiconductor manufacturing. Can you talk a bit about that bill and what it means for, for the US economy? Yes, it's actually getting signed into law right now as we speak. The bill signing is happening uh, in, in Washington DC at the White House. It's a bipartisan bill. Um, basically what it does is it um, incentivizes the production of semiconductor chips here in the United States at one time, America manufactured more than 70% of these chips. It's now down to 12%. Mm. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to reshore a lot of this manufacturing. And as you know, a lot of these semiconductors are essential for the clean energy industry, uh, whether it's solar or wind or other uh, sources of renewables. Uh, we need more semiconductors if we're going to expand our production of um, all the components and all the pieces of the, the solar energy pie here. So I ran a small business before I came to Congress. We actually made semiconductors in part for the solar energy industry. And um, uh, we were only one of a handful of people who did that. And so now hopefully we'll have a much bigger group of entities doing the same. And I believe other educational opportunities in that bill as well. I think might be relevant to this audience. Can you highlight any of those top of mind? Well, there's a massive investment in uh, research and development education opportunities uh, within the semiconductor industry here in the United States. Um, and so, uh, for instance, the NSF budget is going to double. The NIST budget is going to double. Um, and those uh, particular agencies fund a lot of the educational and research opportunities in the clean energy space. It's a big deal. I just happened to be in uh, Taiwan last week. Uh, I buried the lead a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk about that uh, visit a little more later, but one of the things, one of the big 
takeaways for me in visiting these countries is that they are incredibly excited about the CHIPS Act. Mm. They want to take advantage of these incentives to manufacture their semiconductor chips here in the US. And so I put my salesman cap on and pitched Illinois uh, as much as possible because I think that we would be an excellent destination. But the point is that a lot of the world wants to shift for manufacturing these chips in places like the People's Republic of China, which is becoming a more unreliable partner in doing this type of activity, and bring it here to the US. So the CHIPS Act is gonna be a magnet for all these different uh, companies, not only here in the United States getting into the game, but also others across the world coming here. So let's talk about Taiwan. Okay, <laughs> you did okay. travel there with uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi recently. We did then in the wake of that see tensions rise with China. We are, can be familiar with that, that emerging uh, situation. I guess you, you've since defended that trip. You know, you referenced the economic opportunities. Reiterate or, or explain further why you thought that that was important for the US and for you to, sure. to, to go there. Sure, Julia. And I think a lot of you, as vet by the way, thank you for your service. Um, I'm honored to be able to address you. And many of you as veterans probably served in East Asia. And I had the distinct honor of um, meeting many of the troops uh, overseas, and many of them come from Illinois, so that was a special treat for me. But going to your question, I think there are two reasons why it was essential to go to Taiwan. One is, especially in light of Ukraine, we have to make sure that what happened in Ukraine does not happen in Taiwan. And the only way you do that is you achieve peace through strength. We have to bind closer to our partners, allies, and friends in the region, especially Taiwan, and make sure that we stand shoulder to shoulder with them as they face increasing bullying tactics from the Chinese Communist Party. And so there are certain things, certain discussions that you cannot have over Zoom. You have to be in person if you're talking to uh, admirals, generals, commanders, intelligence analysts, or even our Taiwanese counterparts and others uh, that um, are very important for us to understand their needs and how we can supply their needs going forward. By the way, I should just mention, there's something called the Taiwan Relations Act. It is a piece of law that requires us to support the self-defense of Taiwan, even at the same time that we recognize the One China policy. So, um, we are not only, in my opinion, ethically and morally obligated to support uh, other democracies uh, who are under threat, but we are legally obligated as well. And so that was the purpose of, of that visit. So in the wake of that, we did see China say that it would you know, sever certain types of negotiations with the US, specifically on climate, um, which could threaten things like agreements on curbing methane emissions, et cetera. How do you see that playing out? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what are ways that we can make sure that some of those areas of work could still continue despite the tensions? I think we go back after Friday. Ah. You know, after, yep. after this mm. passes through the House, after it gets signed into law probably next week in a big, a huge uh, Oval Office sharing, signing ceremony, we go back to our friends, allies, partners, and then other places like the PRC and basically say, hey, let's talk Turkey. This is what we did. We're putting real skin in the game. And now, what can we do together to make sure uh, that we can uh, collectively tackle this global challenge in a, in a meaningful manner? So that will be, to me, a, a good uh, icebreaker. Yeah. Uh, what we do on Friday and uh, signing the Inflation Reduction Act into law. First things first. Um, we talked about Ukraine a little bit. I want to ask how you think about balancing three core things, affordability for consumers, the need to decarbonize, and then also immediate energy needs, which is still largely in a fossil fuel-based system. Yes. And so even in the Inflation Reduction Act, there is ability to do more um, oil and gas drilling on public lands, et cetera. So how do you balance those three uh, <laughs> concerns and initiatives? Well, I got to go now. <laughs> uh, the, this is, this is the, uh, you know, trillion dollar question, I'm not sure multi what number, yeah, yeah. multi-trillion mm -hmm. dollar question. Um, it, it's a balancing act, honestly. It's both a, it's, it's, it's a scientific question, it's a political question, it's an economic question. It's all of those questions all uh, bound up in, in one challenge. The way I look at it is today, uh, we have to do whatever we can to wean ourselves off of 
Russian fossil fuel. Uh, and that means, you know, in, in the case of Germany, they are going back to using certain types of fossil fuel indigenous to Germany. Uh, and, and other countries are using more nuclear and so forth. But that's a, that's a very important and practical challenge right now because we can't have Russia hold us hostage based on a dependence on them for our energy. That's not going to work. So let's be very practical today. But over the medium term and the long term, we're going to have to switch, right? We're going to have to switch from fossil fuels to other forms of energy. And that's where the Inflation Reduction Act really kind of kicks in and makes it more possible uh, for that to happen. But as of today, uh, the number one challenge is keeping energy prices low, accessible, and uh, making sure we're not reliant on Russian fossil fuel. So one other topic we could spend a whole session on, but we'll do one question on, <laughs> is the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which we're just yeah. starting to see those funds roll out at the state level. Yeah. This is a $1.2 trillion bill. Anything you would highlight on that as it starts to affect states like uh, you know, Illinois and others? Well, it's very interesting. Um, again, regulations are coming out literally by the day on this. Um, you know, I think all of you understand this idea, but you know, the regulations need to come out so that people know exactly um, how the law is going to be implemented. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of regulations, especially come out with regard to electric vehicle uh, charge, charging networks and so forth. Uh, Illinois is going to get $149 million for its EV charging network, for instance. However, I know that uh, the leadership here wants to go for even more, and so there are competitive grant challenges uh, in the billions if we can go after that as well. So um, there's one part of it that I am also focused on, which is the grid. Um, there's money in the infrastructure. It has such a weird name. Uh, it's, it's, it's the IJA, uh, actually, uh, the Infrastructure Investment uh, and Jobs Act, I believe, yep. IJA. Mm -hmm. uh, and so IJA also has multi-billion dollars uh, worth of um, investment tax credits and so forth for upgrading of the grid. And as you know, the grid needs to be upgraded if we're really going to go to a renewable energy economy because that is the rate determining step in many cases for projects, solar projects, for instance, but also wind projects going online and being able to so, uh, basically flow those electrons from one part of the country where they don't need it to the parts of the country where we do. And so that is a big um, uh, issue within the IJA that I'm following. I will, we only have four minutes left with the congressman who has a <laughs> flight, so it's not a joke, he has to go. But I will say, uh, if you have questions for those watching online, you can put them in the Q&A function, and we can probably take maybe one, whoever's fast to get up to that mic, uh, and please keep it short. Um, I'll do my last question in the meantime if anyone wants to get up there. I have to also acknowledge we're in an election year. So, what? Uh, yeah, surprise, breaking <laughs> news. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to know, you know, how do you think Democrats uh, can maintain control of Congress, if you think that's possible, and what would the future look like if that were to, if you were to maintain control? Do you have an easy question? No, <laughs> no, we only had 20 minutes, but all the hard ones. And okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I think the way to maintain control is to do good things for the people of the United States and let the politics take care of itself. Um, so I think the, inve the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to me is significant. Um, when I talked about it with my constituents over the weekend, they really couldn't believe it, that we actually A, <laughs> came to a deal, and B, that it would actually tackle some of their major kitchen table topics that, that you know, really bedevil, uh, bedevil them on a daily basis. So prescription drug prices is an easy one that everyone understands. Um, you know, capping insulin costs at 35 bucks a month for Medicare beneficiaries is a big deal. Um, we can talk all day about why I think it doesn't make any sense for insulin to be any more costly than $35 a month in the first place since the uh, formula for it hasn't changed in decades. But setting that aside, capping it and making sure that people on fixed incomes, namely seniors on Medicare, not having to pay more than 35 bucks a month is a game changer for them in their lives. And so if you go down the line on all those provisions and we can actually get it passed and signed into law and we talk about the future and how it's going to change because of it, I think people are willing to give you another look. 
uh, if they were thinking that things are too broken and um, perhaps we need a change in leadership. Um, we've had 52 days of gas prices going down uh, in a row. That's not good enough, we need a lot more, but for the first time in a long time I saw gas come to less than $4 a gallon yesterday. Uh, I had to do a double take. But that's the type of thing that you talk about and hopefully uh, you know, people see a better future. I think we'll all be watching to see how that rolls out. And we have to, I think, acknowledge that it's fantastic, it's fantastic to see Congress acting. We just talked about a handful of legislation that just got done. So you good know, luck, you know. As, as, as a former president what, uh, was once said, uh, uh, there's so many wins, you're gonna get tired of winning. <laughs> and I think that uh, Joe Biden, uh, to his credit, uh, even in quarantine, has managed to get, you know, uh, hopefully the Inflation Reduction Act done. The PACT Act, I don't know if anybody's following that. Tomorrow, that's getting signed into law. Finally, veterans who suffered from uh, being exposed to burn pits are gonna get relief, finally. Um, of course, we're talking about the CHIPS Act. Uh, we took out the number two, President Biden at his leadership took out the number two leader of Al-Qaeda, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, um, and the list goes on and on. So hopefully people start to notice, but we have a lot of work to do. And with one minute, please ask uh, <laughs> a question. <laughs> Congressman, thanks for being here. Um, I appreciate your comments about um, bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. I'm curious if you think um, what's in the Inflation Reduction Act is going to be enough to compete with China's demand economy, if you think it's sort of the, the start of a, a much larger, longer process. I think it's the start of a process. Um, obviously, within the People's Republic of China, they, they subsidize uh, the production of pretty much every part of that value chain to such a degree that um, uh, you know, they, they try to undercut their competitors and, and they often succeed. But all that being said, that's why I think when I first was talking about those tariffs, I think we do have to put countervailing tariffs on Chinese components and Chinese made uh, goods because of precisely the issue that you said so that our companies can compete. I think a lot of other countries are doing the same, by the way, with regard to Chinese made equipment. And by the way, I should just mention, um, now there's credible information that a lot of this equipment is made in forced labor camps, uh, especially by the Uyghurs. Um, so there's all kinds of just bad stuff happening in the PRC. And so I think we have to tariff that stuff. We will leave it on that note, as I know you have to go. Congressman, thank you so much thank for your you, time. Thank you, Julia. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you for your service. Thank you. So while we're getting set up here with the, with the chairs for our first panel discussion, uh, I want to thank the Congressman Raja, Julia, for a great interview. I was particularly pleased that Congressman Raja talked about the grid distribution networks, something that I think was stripped out of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, Congressman, if you're still here, I think that was right, wasn't it? W w wasn't the distribution stripped out of that, the Inflation Reduction Act? The distribution lines uh, across the country, you talked about the grid, grid security. I don't think that's in there. It's not in there, right, but, but it was in the infrastructure bill. And that's what you talked about. And so that's a win, right? Because without the distribution, right, it doesn't matter what the source is. So thank you for covering that. And thank you, sir, appreciate you coming. The other thing that the Congressman talked about is Asia, right? So lest we forget, while we're preoccupied with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the blockade in the Black Sea, you know, we got, the, we got the, the big problem that we pivoted to right back in, you know, 2011, 2012 that remains uh, probably our number one national security risk. So thanks for covering Asia as well. Um, before I bring my panel up, and I'm going to make uh, my handler very angry here, but I'm going to ad lib something. One of the best things that we do at the Veterans Vance Energy Project is our fellowship program. And we have some of the finest Americans that you will ever meet as our fellow this year. And I'm finally getting to meet them in person, thankfully, after a couple of years of COVID. And what a difference. Uh, you know, when we first started out, small potatoes, we had the future leaders of the advanced energy industry. Well, let me tell you, gang, we got the, we got the current leaders of the advanced energy industry as our fellows this year, public, private, non-profit, uh, uh, non across the spectrum, 
and all you know, really dedicated to their craft, which is advanced energy. So what, what I would like to do very quickly is ask our current and our past fellows just to stand up right now and let's give them a, hand, a round of applause. And if you get an opportunity to introduce yourself to them today, I, I can promise you, you, uh, you won't be sorry. Uh, fascinating people. Okay, uh, let's bring on our first panel. All right, good. So, um, once again, on behalf of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center and the National Resource Defense Council, who is our partner for this particular panel and for this event, let me welcome you to our first panel. Um, this panel is on global energy and climate security. What could be a better topic to kick off this event with? Um, and we're also going to consider the impact, of course, on national security. So it's that nexus of all three. And not only apropos in terms of today and what we're seeing around the world and here domestically, per Congressman Raja's discussion, but this is our mission here at the Ver Veterans Advanced Energy Project. As Dan Mish talked about earlier, our mission is to empower veterans and military spouses to continue to serve in the advanced energy industry, to give them a venue to continue to serve. And it makes sense to them intuitively because these are veterans and military spouses who for the past three decades have experienced firsthand what it is to be energy dependent, too energy dependent upon other sources around the world. And we've been fighting great patriotic wars all around the globe in response in one way or another. They, they get that. They also get the national security implications of climate risk because here again, they have responded to humanitarian assistance disaster relief operations and those like them, security operations around the globe as a, res as, as, as a result of climate change and the exacerbation of regional instability due to climate change. And it, it's not only overseas in terms of our ability to respond and set the conditions for the kind of lifestyle, the American life that we want, but it's here domestically as well. We're gonna talk about our military installations, which are currently under threat. And not just the, you know, the ubiquitous threat of uh, hurricanes ramping up the East Coast and, and the flooding, you know, sunny day flooding in places like Norfolk. In fact, Bob, I think you, you talk about that in your book. That's right, yeah. But, uh, but on the West Coast, right, with the wildfire threat, Camp Pendleton's just about burned down a couple times. You know, the heat out in Yuma, you know, across the Midwest, the, the drought, is making it very difficult to train. Very, very, very difficult to train. And these are the bases that we deploy, we project power around the world from. So if we can't train, we can't project power, we got a national security problem, folks. So climate change, once again, is a, is, is a national security, uh, uh, creates national security and stability. So, so with that, um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to do some introductions here. And then I'm going to ask a few questions, but be thinking about the questions you want to ask our panel, because we have a very esteemed panel, uh, very lucky to have them, public, private, nonprofit, across the spectrum. These are experts in their trade. Uh, Zara Summers is vice president of science at Lanza Tech right here in Chicago. And her portfolio is the kind of portfolio you would dream about, uh, particularly this day and time. Pretty good place right now with the Inflation Reduction Act passing at uh, Lanza Tech. Sustainability, corporate research and development, and strategy development. What's more, we have big energy here on the panel, right, with, uh, with Zara. Zara, prior to joining Lanza Tech, Zara was head of bioscience at ExxonMobil. She created the first ever bioscience department pioneering biologically based solutions for fuels and products to reduce carbon intensity and environmental impacts. So, Zara, welcome. Thank you. Josh Salislak is Managing Director, Deloitte Consulting, Government and Public Service, where he leads sustainability and climate adaptation support to clients across the firm. Josh is an internationally recognized expert on climate and disaster resilience and has had a long and distinguished career to include a number of senior administration positions, 
such as Associate Director for Climate Preparedness and Resilience at the White House Council for Environmental Quality, and Senior Advisor to Secretary for Infrastructure Resilience at U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Please wel wel welcome Josh to our panel. <laughs> Bob Keefe is the author among the group, Executive Director, Environmental Entrepreneurs, and a longtime friend of the Veterans, Veterans Advanced Energy Project. Bob has recently written Climate Nomics. I got it right. Nice. <laughs> Practice that. Washington, Wall Street, and the Economic Battle to Save Our Planet. Once again, what, 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 what couldn't be more appropriate for our discussion today? Notably, blurbed by far fetched people such as Arnold Schwarzenegger and our own advisory board member, John Powers. Previously, Bob was National Resource Defense Council. And before that, a journalist with the Atlantic Journal contributor, Cox Newspapers, and the Austin American Statesman. Welcome, Bob. <laughs> Drew Warren is Senior Advisor, Veteran Affairs and Public Policy at Dominion Energy. Drew has 25 plus years of global experience in national security operations, government policy implement implementation oversight, development of strategic partnerships, and advising senior leaders across the military, government, and business sectors. Drew is a former Marine Corps Infantry Officer, U.S. House of Representatives Armed Service uh, Professional Staffer, Senior Special Assistant for Legislative Affairs within the Office of Secretary of Defense. In other words, a distinguished career of public service. Please welcome Drew Warren. <laughs> Robert Rudish is Department of Energy's Office Director and Energy Attaché at U.S. Embassy Warsaw Poland. Previously, Robert was a U.S. Army and National Guard officer and worked in the Office of Radiological Security at the National Nuclear Security Administration. I was particularly interested to see Robert's uh, LinkedIn posts in Polish talking about energy security in Europe. And his priorities in his current roles are to reach net zero while ensuring energy security in the region and across the Atlantic. Welcome, Robert. Okay, so distinguished panel, lots of opportunities, lots of ground to cover, let's get to it. Um, Zara, I understand that uh, Lanza Tech recently developed an important new technology that converts carbon emissions from steel mills or gasified waste biomass directly into monoethylene glycol, MEG. That's right. How I'm does this promote U.S. climate and energy security? Well, and I think a way to look at it is it's not just MEG, it's ethanol, it's isopropyl alcohol, it's acetone, it's a suite of other chemicals we have in our pipeline that's coming online as, you know, as we speak, my folks are in the lab making it happen. And when you think about what we're doing, it's, it's we're creating a list of products we can make from emissions, emissions from steel mills, from refineries, from gasified biomass, um, even landfill gas. And why, why is that important? It's, it's taking things that we have in our communities, things we have distributed throughout the country and making them the feedstock to make these products. And so that ethanol can go to polyethylene. That ethanol can, we have a process through Lanzagut to make sustainable aviation fuel. So MEG, all these other, other products are things that we currently would rely on other sources or potentially fossil sources. And I know oil and gas is here. I was oil and gas for <laughs> 10 years. But I think it's an all hands moment and, and bringing, bringing it home and making any community resilient enough to, to use what, what is within their reach to make these important products. I think that's, I mean, that's how we are self-sustaining. Right. So how does that compare to your time at Exxon Mobil? Um, I learned a lot at ExxonMobil, um, but right now, when I think about the speed at which we take something from the lab and put it in a commercial plant, it's really hard to do that in some organizations that are in risk management, you know, and every, every new technology, switching technologies to bio is a risk. And we were joking about, at, at the table I was sitting at, they're you know, a fast second, maybe fast third, 
And so when I left ExxonMobil, it was really to see things happen quickly and see technology develop in a way that we weren't reliant on everybody getting on board with a new technology. It was really technology focused, getting, getting things deployed rapidly because the climate is warming. The climate is changing. It's not gonna wait around for us to, to really do everything to get everybody on board. It's some pioneers need to get out there and show that it's possible to, to drag everybody else along, kicking and screaming or, you know, following gladly, sure. depending on the industry. <laughs> but I, I think it's agility, it's flexibility, and it's speed, which is the biggest difference I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, Josh, uh, so the proposed Inflation Reduction Act <clears throat> is going to require strategy, policy, implementation to meet targets. How can Deloitte Federal help the federal government meet these targets? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, let me take a sponsor's privilege here for one second Please. and um, say welcome to Deloitte Chicago. Uh, we're glad to have you all here and a special uh, Thank you for your service to our veterans and our military families who are joining us today and online. Um, you know, we, we heard the congressman talk about the speed at which we kind of got to a decision once we got to a decision, and we've been talking about this for two years now. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the important part of this is about the investment and the assurity investment. And this is a conversation I have with government all the time um, and with folks who want to know you know, how do, in government, how do we make the private sector, how do we bring the private sector to the table in something? Mm -hmm. I said, you know, the private sector doesn't mind risk. They make risk decisions all the time, mm -hmm. but they have to understand the risk. And they have to understand that this is not something that's gonna change tomorrow, that they have a long-term um, guideway to actually do this work. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what gives us mm -hmm. the ability to get folks to make that investment. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much patient capital out there looking for these types of investment. Mm -hmm. Trillions and trillions of dollars. I mean, the money that Congress has put into this is great. But the money that we need to access is mm -hmm. private sector investment. Mm -hmm. And private sector investment wants to be here because institutional investors mm -hmm want to be in this space. Okay, so how does Deloitte help? Mm. Um, you know, Deloitte has been, we've been in business for 178 years. Um, and I recently joined the firm, so I've learned all this really cool stuff, and, and we're the largest. Perhaps to vest over all that Yeah, time. yeah, it's 178 years. Yeah, you, you, it's, a, it's, it's a great deal if you can stick it out. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have a really good health program to help with that. But um, what, what is fascinating about the firm is, you know, the two things that the government needs in this space, um, the two, two things the government doesn't need in this space are policy help. Very clearly, the White House and Congress have, have made it very clear what the climate policy of this country is, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. The other one they don't need help with is science, because quite honestly, they have some of the best climate scientists in the world, NOAA, NASA, the other science agencies. Mm -hmm. What they do need help with is program implementation and measurement. Mm -hmm. How do you measure success? Mm -hmm. How do you implement these programs? Mm -hmm. How do you measure success? Mm -hmm. Well, we've been doing program implementation pretty much as long as the firm's been around. Mm -hmm. um, and we have certainly been doing measurement for 178 years. Mm -hmm. About every quarter. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and so what we help clients do is figure out what the outcome looks like. Where do you want to be when you're done? What does success look like? What does success look like and how do you measure it? Mm -hmm. What's keeping you from getting there? Mm -hmm. And design programs, tools, and processes to help you get there. Okay. Um, our goal is to help clients be successful. Okay. And that's what we're doing with the federal government. You got the contract. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, so, my work here is done. So, so let me follow up. What, what does this mean to our audience? A lot of our audience uh, are either transitioning service members, military spouses, or they're, they're in the industry. They want to transition in the industry. What does this, this Inflation Reduction Act mean in terms of jobs to our audience? Well, I'll quote President Biden. When I hear climate, I hear jobs. Okay. And there are a lot of jobs. This creates a lot of jobs. And these are good, high-paying jobs. These are jobs that people know how to do. This is not, you know, um, 
Dr. Sullivan, excuse me. This is not working in her lab, right? It could be. It could be. <laughs> and, and, there are, and there are a number of our veterans who are well qualified to do that. But there are also a number of our veterans who are well qualified to do the work that we are talking about doing. Some of that is engineering, some of that is installation, some of that is manufacturing, um, some of that is um, getting out into the community and talking to people about what, what we have on offer. Sure. And those are jobs that will exist, and they will exist all over the country. Mm -hmm. These are not just technology jobs that are gonna be in San Francisco and you know New York um, or Austin. They are gonna be all over the country. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and, and just as a reminder, we're going to have employers strewn about those tables, as Dan Mish talked about, as some of these breaks, you have an opportunity to talk to them. Um, Bob, let me, let me turn to you. Thank you for that. That was, that was great, Josh. Um, Bob, let me turn to you and, and ask you, I know that you, you talk a lot in your book about uh, DOD installations yeah. and, and the climate peril to DOD installations and what it means from a national security perspective. Can you talk a little bit more, what is that peril, how serious is it, and how is DOD doing at getting at that Absolutely. risk? Yeah, thank you, Greg. I, I must say, though, when, when I know your background as a base commander and I saw that clipboard, I thought we were going to have <laughs> push-ups or something up here, so I'm glad. Old school, glad, man. Yeah, that's right. There you yeah. go. Well, look, I want to talk about what happened three years and 11 months ago uh, uh, in my home state of North Carolina. It, in September of 2018, Hurricane Florence washed ashore on the coast of North Carolina, had Camp Lejeune straight and hit, hit it dead center, pretty much. 6,000 housing units there, 70% of them were flooded. Out of the non-housing uh, non units there, almost 90% uh, were flooded. Caused something like uh, $7.5 billion worth of damage, you're still cleaning it up today. One month later, uh, Hurricane Michael slammed into Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida's Panhandle home of the 325th fighter wing, mm -hmm. most expensive planes on the planet. Tyndall Air Force Base. That's right. Right, F-22s. So. That's right, yep, that's yep. right. Uh, uh, almost 100% of buildings there were damaged by flooding. Still cleaning that up, something like $5 billion damage. Five months later, middle of the country, not too far from here, off at Air Force Base, uh, home of the doomsday planes, the, fl the flying white houses, when we're at war, uh, uh, nuclear war or otherwise, got hit by the worst thunderstorm event in the history of our country, a derecho. Uh, flooded the runway so much that it's unclear whether those planes could have even gotten off of the mm. ground. Another three, four billion dollars. That one, that one six, eight month period alone, we had more than $10 billion worth of damage mm -hmm. to our military bases. Guess mm -hmm. who pays for that, guys? Mm -hmm. Me, you, everyone in this audience, and everybody that uh, pays taxes in this country. Mm -hmm. So climate change is, has become, yes, we know it is a national security issue. It's been a security, national security issue even before Chuck Hagel said in 2014 that it's a threat multiplier. But it's also an economic issue now. It's a huge economic issue. Across the country, climate-related disasters cost our country about $150 billion last year alone. That's just in direct damage, and a lot of that, as mentioned, there's nothing that, uh, uh, that is different about a military base or uh, housing uh, development in the middle of the country or on the coast. They're gonna get hit. So this is a huge issue. The military, fortunately, has started to figure this out, but I think, Greg, you and I agree that they're not going fast enough. Yeah. Uh, and climate change comes in many forms. Uh, yes, it's those storms that we've been talking about, but Greg, I know this is important to you, uh, heat. Uh, and heat in places like whether it's uh, uh, Fort Hood in Texas or Paris Island where you were, it's hard to train when uh, it's too hot for humans to be out there for a, a long amount of time. Yeah. So it is a huge issue and it's something yeah. we gotta address. So, you know, J Josh talked about establishing standards that help the government get to where they wanna go. Yeah. So how's DOD doing in, in, in determining or defining what success looks like for its installations? What, what is a resilient installation by you know, DOD terms? Well, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I know that some other people on this panel probably have a better idea, but I think it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, 
and uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. uh, for businesses, for business people, for the people that work at those businesses to make those bases harder. Well, yep. good news Rhino is you got Josh. you got the guy who actually knows the answer to that yeah. question coming on the screen. I right. think after us, and the work that that Richard Kidd and the team um, right. at OSD is right. doing around climate adaptation is amazing because good. they are tying it back to the mission. Good, and that is what what you need to do in DOD is sure. you need to tie it back to the mission. Right. It supports the warfighter. Yeah. Okay. Directly. And and is money flowing in support of mission readiness and, and making these installations more resilient? Well, money is always flowing in support of the warfighter and making things ready for the mission, right? Yeah. So yeah. when it when you tie it back to the mission, yeah. there are always resources yeah. for it. And yeah. you know, and the secretary made it very clear in his the first thing he put out mm. um, you know, around uh, COVID and climate change. Mm -hmm. And that is very, very important. Um, mm -hmm. If you read the, the letter, the uh, uh, intro to the DOD climate plan, mm -hmm. um, yep. this is part of the mission. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Bob. Hey, Drew, let, let, let's pull Dominion Energy into this. Uh, obviously, you know, a nationwide energy company. Uh, for those who don't know, Dominion is putting together one of the largest offshore wind systems in the world. No easy thing. Um, fundamentally changing the equation, the energy equation, at least up and down the East Coast and maybe beyond. What does the Inflation Reduction Act mean to Dominion Energy in terms of the way you're going to do business now? And, 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 you know, how you maintain that baseline power and, you know, the whole, right, you know, formula of, of old energy, new energy, and so forth. Yeah. Well, let me just start by thanking the Atlantic Council and, and Greg for the opportunity for Dominion to partner and, and be a sponsor of, of this event. And I say that because um, this is really important to our company, our culture. This is part of uh, who Dominion Energy is, is to be uh, with groups such as this and um, to talk about these issues and then be in the conversation of change and leading that as we go forward. So uh, again, on behalf of our leadership team and uh, our customers across 16 states, um, we welcome you and, and again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, so. I will answer that question by kind of going back to a previous topic, which was jobs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think Josh talked about that. And what I will say is that for veterans and for military spouses and for the demographic that um, I hope uh, you know is listening today, much of what, because I went through this through my transition, much of what you desire is to find not just a job, but you look to find um, that purpose. And uh, one of my um, you know, Dominion senior executives uh, has been quoted as saying that we are in a time now transitioning to clean energy, which will be the most important and positive economic transformation since the internet. Now, whether you believe that or not, um, I would say that uh, there's certainly a lot of evidence in that. And if you don't think that's a significant um, you know, time in our history and, and purpose and calling, um, you know, again, I think history will be the judge. But what we offer, not just at our company, but across this industry, is the ability to, that's right, change the way we work, live, and um, our behavior and how we act, which will eventually lead to, um, you know, helping save some of um, our, our planet for future generations. But we're in a time of significant innovation. Um, the president of the Virginia portion of our business has been with our company for 28 years, uh, Mr. Ed Bain. And he said, you know, in the first 22 years, um, the amount of innovation and change and technological advancement that occurred uh, was equal to what he's seen in the last six years. Mm. So, you know, mm. in, in his time across, um, you know, the industry of 
producing energy from gas, um, oil, coal, all of that, to now uh, solar, wind, uh, and how we balance the portfolio, which mm -hmm. I think is you know, the question. Mm -hmm. How do we do that responsibly? Uh, and certainly wind will be a part of that, but from a responsible uh, perspective that our company looks to do for our customers, we believe that reliability is our first and foremost job. Um, and for those of you who have served in uniform, it is mission first. You know, people always, you hear that a lot. If you don't accomplish the mission, and for us, that's providing reliable energy to our customers. Mm -hmm. At a affordable uh, means, and doing it in a safe way, way mm -hmm. for both our customers and our employees. Mm -hmm. Those are what drives us every day. <coughs> and so this offshore wind project is uh, you know, the largest investment that we have ever made, um, $9.6 billion, uh, a project that you know, would, at completion of 2026, would be able to power about 660,000 homes. Mm. Um, so it is significant. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not going to, to continue to do uh, energy production in other ways as well, because we recognize that we can't control the weather. And um, we will have uh, good days and bad days um, that will land upon our 176 turbines uh, when it's in full operational capability. But until we get to that point, um, you know, we have to maintain to keep the lights on. And that's our that's our pledge to to our customers. So it's a balance of uh, you know what the Inflation Reduction Act you know certainly provides a lot of opportunity and jobs, a lot of innovation opportunity for our company, mm -hmm. and I think probably lastly it provides uh, a way for us to serve our nation and our community through um, through security. So let, let me pause on that that last point about security. Do you see, from Dominion Energy's perspective, public-private opportunities in order to harden our DOD installations and improve resiliency? Absolutely, and going into kind of one of my previous roles when I worked on the House Armed Services Committee, mm -hmm. um, I had the readiness portfolio, and right there we saw that energy resiliency is mission readiness. and. Um, Unfortunately, you know, and I can kind of speak about, um, you know, th this is probably negative, but I understand why this is the case. Um, you know, operation and maintenance, for those of you who understand budgeting and O&M funds and uh, FSRM, the facilities uh, rest restoration and maintenance funding, is often the bill payer for transformative capabilities we need to fight and, and win in the future, right? And so O&M is where we don't uh, fund to where we should. And that's where uh, upgrading and maintaining our, our grids and uh, our infrastructure of on-base facilities uh, takes probably a back seat. Dominion has uh, got numerous projects both completed and underway where we are partnering to uh, help upgrade, uh, make more resilient, make more secure uh, through our feder federal energy solutions program. And again, if you're someone who's looking to transition into a role, this is a way to still maintain some of that, um, you know, con connectivity with, you know, the mili uh, military and federal um, bases and, and facilities, mm -hmm. because. We know now that uh, to attack and to uh, disrupt doesn't mean coming through the front gate. It often means finding a way into the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, if you can't take off and recover aircraft, and if you can't maintain your communication suite, which requires um, electricity and power, then you won't be able to accomplish your mission. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, we take extreme uh, pride and are humbled by the fact that we're able to not only be the energy provider uh, for the Pentagon um, and for many of the other 
significant national security agencies within the Northern Virginia area, mm -hmm. but we look for ways to partner with these groups mm -hmm. to upgrade their structure and uh, maintain their, uh, their security. Thank you for that. Do you see opportunities for our audience and those that are listening in in this, uh, this fundamental transition to cleaner energy, more secure energy? Absolutely, and as I mentioned, I think that you know there are a lot of new technologies, uh, battery storage, um, solar, wind, those are all things, but we have to still maintain our core capabilities and we have line workers uh, that are the, I mean, the backbone and bedrock of our company that are out there every day um, ensuring that power is being delivered to, to our customers. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, you know, kind of watch and COCs, if you will, that um, make sure that the load is distributed equally. Th the number of kind of uh, similarities between, you know, things that you would find in military day-to-day uh, -day operations and how we run our company, mm -hmm. uh, very similar, and uh, we welcome uh, in every aspect of our company, we would love to bring in our veterans, military spouses as they seek transition. Opportunity to continue service. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I hope we're going to come back to that too, by the way. Jobs. Go ahead. No, no, I don't want to jump in. Okay. We'll come back to that. Remind me. Hey, Robert, let, let's, let's turn to a completely different perspective here, right? You know, from, from your perch over in Europe, uh, how is Russia weaponizing energy? And what are the second, third order effects that you're seeing from Poland? It's a great question. Um, you know, first, I, I do want to thank you for having me here today. Uh, we get tremendous support from, from the Atlantic Council, uh, both the Department of Energy, uh, the Global Energy Center has been a great supporter of our PTEC initiative, Partnership for Transatlantic Energy and Climate Cooperation, which ties right into this. Um, and we have a brand shiny new Atlantic Council office in uh, Warsaw, Poland that we're wow. really excited about. Unpaid political advertisement <laughs> for Atlantic Council, <laughs> nicely done. Um, so, so I'm really glad I could Your be here. Your fees are waived. Because <laughs> this is a really important nexus. Yeah. Um, you know, energy security is national security. Um, it, it, is, it is such a key piece of what we do. I mean, we, we assume that if we just flip a switch, the lights will come on. If we dial the thermostat, we'll have the temperature we want. When we need gas, we go to the pump. Um, and what we're seeing in Europe is people questioning that, um, questioning that, that assurance. Um, so, a, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Russia, Russia is absolutely launching uh, an energy war against Europe. Uh, the conflict in Ukraine um, extends far beyond Ukraine's borders. Uh, we're a couple hours drive in Warsaw, but we can see across the continent um, people are getting worried about their supply of energy. Uh, there is there's more than enough gas uh, if Russia would choose to export it. Uh, and by slowly constraining the supply of energy, uh, and slowly eliminating Europe's gas supply, what they're hoping to do is to cause that very instability um, for people to, to question their, their government's ability to provide. Um, and for governments, for our allies and, and partners um, to, to start to wrangle amongst each other, to create division as they fight for limited mm -hmm. resources. Um, so we do have the Partnership for Transatlantic Atlantic Energy and Climate Cooperation uh, mm -hmm. through the Department of Energy, mm -hmm. along with a, a, a number of initiatives through the Department of State and Defense and other entities mm -hmm. to help our European allies um, mm -hmm. and, and to, to help make sure that, that, they, that they can cooperate and coordinate and that we can get them the resources they need to preserve the stability they need um, and, and to keep their economies going. Um, so, you know, short term, that means bringing in energy resources from around the world, including from the United States, uh, to, to help them help them replace some of those volumes that Russia is withholding. Mm -hmm. um, it also means coordinating, coordinating not only to 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 share the resources they have, uh, but to use them I as efficiently as possible to apply some of these things uh, that we 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 talked about a little bit in in the uh, Inflation Act and in the BUILD Act, um, apply these technologies and techniques 
to make sure we're, we're really keeping all the energy we have and using it as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we also have to look longer term, um, you know, to look at ways to kind of permanently remove this leverage that Russia has. Uh, to make sure that Russia isn't in a per position to perpetually be uh, agitating in Europe and compromising security in Europe by eliminating the dependency on, on Russian hydrocarbons, on Russian energy mm -hmm. in general, uh, both for the stability uh, of our allies and also a, as an opportunity to bring in new technologies, to bring in these clean energy technologies uh, that in a lot of cases can, can replace Russian hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, another European member, European Union member, Germany, arguably the most powerful country in the European Union, has gone to war footing with regard to energy. And a lot of people are questioning whether Angela Merkel made a wise decision in divesting Germany of its nuclear power you know, back, I think, around 2000, what, 10, 11, 12. And now there's a sense that perhaps Germany is a little bit overly compliant with regard to the Russian invasion. What's your sense from Poland of all that? You know, I mean, the, the view from Poland, uh, the view of the Polish government ha has long been that, that Germany has an over-reliance on Russian gas. Uh, and the Polish government has raised this issue on, on a number of occasions. Uh, certainly, the, the German economy benefits from a low cost of gas. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, you know, when she was in leadership, Angela Merkel Angela Merkel made the decision to, to shut down um, the country's nuclear fleet after Fukushima. Uh, you know, we certainly took a different decision here in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the United States, we've kept our fleet running and we're growing our fleet. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, there's a, a lot of great, a lot of great resources in the Build Act and the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act to help keep our nuclear fleet up and running so that we do have that that domestic supply of energy. Uh, you know, one of the great things about nuclear energy is not only is it clean, but it's very easy to keep multiple years of, of fuel on hand mm -hmm. so that you don't have to worry about, you know, what today's flow is or, mm -hmm. or ne next week's flow. You can have years. Um, Baseline power. Yeah. And, and Germany has, has, has gone to a lot of renewables as well. Uh, renewables are great for energy security. You know, nobody kicks your sun and wind away. Mm -hmm. um, but, but not having nuclear energy puts them in a much more challenging position than they would otherwise be in. Good. Craig, one note, there, there's yeah. also money in the IIJA on small modular reactor research. Um, okay. And that's, you know, I think instead of just saying we're going to keep what we have, we're actually going to figure out what works mm -hmm. going forward. And advanced nuclear is clearly part of that investment that Congress has funded. Yeah. And we're going to start for, you know, for the first time in, in a generation, really, we're going to start new, new, new nuclear reactors in the United States this year. And for the first time ever, we're going to start advanced nuclear reactors this year. Uh, we're going to start two in Georgia. And then, as you said, we're going to bring a whole host of SMR technologies online. Uh, Department of Energy is funding a tremendous amount of work there. And I can't tell you how much appetite there is in Europe for this. Uh, I, I don't think a day goes by where I don't hear from a new contact about wanting to bring a new uh, advanced nuclear technology into Europe or from a European counterpart asking how they can deploy nuclear technology on the continent. But the Navy guys out there know we've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, they've been <laughs> floating them around the world, right, Dan? So, hey, uh, let me ask the panel writ large, uh, just to follow up on the, what do we think of small nuclear reactors, modular nuclear reactors, from a national security application perspective? In other words, there's talk about using them to power a thought, the Ford operating base. Are we comfortable with that? Is this, is this something that, no kidding, we can do securely? and uh, in the near term anyway? Any, any thoughts on that one? I, I think we don't know the answer to that right now, okay. which is why we need to do the research and okay. we need to look at this. Safety and security have to be key to that, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. There are some inherent things from a um, kind of engineering standpoint around these uh, uh, small modular reactors yeah. that allow them to be um, less likely to get into a situation like uh, Fukushima or okay. um, Chernobyl or any of the, I mean, you can literally drop them in a swimming pool. So okay. um, there, there are some inherent things in it and why that technology really needs to be advanced. Okay. Um, but 
we shouldn't be making decisions about what we're going to do without actually putting the work in. Mm -hmm. And th this is a little bit of a plug for pure research because, mm -hmm. you know, if we hadn't done pre pure research 20 years ago in um, messenger RNA, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have a COVID vaccine. Mm. Um, yep. That is a direct result yep. of our doing that research early on yep. and being prepared to then to be implement that. Okay. Um, which is why DOE is funding through the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations uh, wow. early stage investment in this. So I just want everyone to take note that Josh Salislak just linked RNA research to small nuclear reactors. <laughs> he said it couldn't be done. Um, Bob, you had a follow up. Uh, I did. I wanted to talk a little bit more about those jobs that we've been talking about because yeah. I know it's something of interest to a lot of folks here. So my organization, E2, Greg, has been tracking clean energy jobs around the country for more than a decade. And actually just last week we came out with our seventh annual Clean Jobs America report, which tracks clean energy jobs across every sector in every state. What we know is that there are about 3.2 million people that now work in clean energy in America. That grew by about 5% last year. Um, you know, uh, uh, renewables, solar and wind, about 500,000 up 6% last year. Mm. Grid and storage, 143,000 mm. up 7%. Clean vehicles, huge uh, growth in clean vehicles yeah. as we all can expect, uh, that including a lot here in the Midwest. Clean vehicle growth up 26% yeah. last year alone. Yeah. Energy efficiency, the biggest part of clean energy uh, more than 2.2 million people work in energy efficiency right now, uh, up to three, three and a half percent, I think. But important to note, uh, Greg, about 10 percent of clean energy workers in America are veterans. That's a bigger percentage than a lot of other sectors, most sectors mm -hmm. of our economy. Mm -hmm. And why is that? First of all, uh, you can ask uh, folks like Michael Rucker, who's a uh, 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 E2 member in Colorado who owns a wind company and he basically says look I'm gonna hire all the veterans I can because they're not afraid to shimmy up those <laughs> those uh, wind turbines and they're not gonna be afraid yeah. for it. Well the older ones are. That's right yeah. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it also goes back to that sense of purpose Greg and that sense of mission and that commitment to national security and yeah. to our country. Yeah. We have another great member in Iowa uh, uh, who was in the Navy SEAL for SEAL teams for six years started a company called ideal energy. Troy Van Beek, I think he's been here. We've had Troy on a Troy has been here a couple times before. Yep. When you talk to Troy, he says, why, I, I ask him, why did you start this company? He's, he's like, because I, of that sense of mission, I want to continue to give something back yep. to my country. This is it. Yep. We, we have Bowerbird Energy from the East Coast in the house. Uh, a, again, a, a veteran-owned company that has uh, uh, started, I believe, because of that sense of purpose and that dedication to to our country. So uh, the, the opportunities that are going to result from clean energy growth from things like the Inflation Reduction Act, $370 billion pumped into our economy, that's going to create a hell of a lot of jobs. Uh, and those jobs are very befitting, uh, and those investments are very befitting of veterans and veteran-owned companies. Yeah, here, here. Uh, I'm going to go out to the audience for questions as soon as you're ready. So be thinking about your questions and just raise your paw and I'll get a microphone over to you and we'll, we'll, we'll get uh, some input here, give and take. Um, Sarah, let me turn back to you. We have a question? Mr. Patrick Littlefield. You got a mic over there somewhere? Well done. Morning, everybody. Um, great panel. Thank Good you. Good morning, Patrick. Question for you. Um, we've talked a lot about the U.S. We've talked a lot about Europe. Um, Recently, the Congo announced their plans to auction off land for oil drilling. C could you just pump it up just a tiny bit? Sure. Oh, thank uh, you. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. We talked a lot about the U.S. We've talked about Europe. Uh, recently, the Congo announced their intention to auction off land in, in, the, in the Congolese forest for oil drilling. Um, and uh, so the question raises, obviously, that has a lot of impact on climate. Th those f f uh, forests are important kind of consumers of carbon. How should we be thinking about climate in terms of the, the global issues? And anybody, you know, our own house may be in good order, but if, if the neighborhood around us is burning down, we aren't going to be there for long. And I, where that takes me is to diplomacy in the State Department. So from a global perspective, how should we be thinking about those 
for yeah. <clears throat> climate security and resilience. Kind of follow suit with the Amazon, yeah. Um, anyone want to take that on? I mean, from a pure science Please. perspective, I can help, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but just simply stopping deforestation is gigatons of carbon saved. Mm -hmm. And so for people to forget that would be a tragedy. Yeah. Um, and and uh, assigning monetary impacts of that, I think people like yourself yeah. and others could, could help to bring to light. It's not just tree huggers. It's... It's the actual fate well, of the climate. Well, can I just follow up, and then I'll turn to you, John. It, but it's also the kind of trees, right? And the whole uh, the whole idea of old growth forests yeah. versus new saplings right. that we're planting as yeah. part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Right. It's not the same no. in terms of the carbon sap. Right. right. A loblolly pine that big is not the same as an old no. growth forest, let alone the below ground carbon that you'll lose in all the root systems and the, roots and and the soils when it's taken down. Please. Right. So let's talk about the economics for a second. Um, we did a study, uh, I think we released it a couple of months ago um, uh, at Davos in Switzerland. And the, the interesting thing is we looked at what happens economically from a global perspective um, if we do something about climate change over the next 50 years. Um, if we can keep the um, global warming to around 1.5 C. Um, and what happens if we don't? So mm -hmm. we ran the economic model in five different sectors around the, uh, uh, around the world. We put the whole thing into a global model. Uh, bottom line, in, at 2070, in, in about 50 years, if we do nothing, the entire global economy loses $178 trillion in value, okay? In, in GDP, global That's real GDP. money. It's real money, okay? There's a whole lot of people's lives that go with that. This is not just money, that's, that's people's lives, okay? Yeah. But if we do something, so, is climate change inevitable? Is it too expensive? We can't afford to do it anyway? Well, it turns out no. Um, if we actually make these investments, mm -hmm. if we do this work, if we create these jobs, mm -hmm. we grow the economy by a net $44 trillion globally. Wow. Wow. Okay? So real money to be made, yeah. even more to be lost. Now, that's just climate change. We're also looking at, um, and we're starting to do some work around what the value of nature is, right? What is biodiversity worth? And there's a task force um, hmm. similar to the task force on climate-related financial disclosures on nature-related financial disclosures. Mm -hmm. And we are starting, companies are starting to look at what is the value of biodiversity and how important is it to their business, not just to the world, but hmm. to your business. Bottom These line. are not, yeah. These are not just environmental issues. No. These are jobs and economic issues. You know, we're not going to kill the planet from the planet's perspective. We're going to kill our ability to live on the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the thing we have to be thinking about. Yeah. But we can change this. And we can do it by making these investments, creating these jobs, and getting great people to take and do these jobs. So it's a great answer. What Patrick talked about was the Congo. And he talked about a country that may not be thinking necessarily long-term 2070. They're thinking, hey, you US, you had your yeah. time in the sunshine. Yeah. We want ours. This is near term. This, this is a huge issue. And this is why we are investing in, um, in Africa, in Asia, um, in climate technology and clean energy. And we have to do it because those countries' economies require energy. Hmm. And if they only have the natural resources that they have, if they just can sell what they have, hmm. um, they are going to do that because they, they have to. Yeah. And we have to help them do, do this a better way. Yeah. Greg, what I, what I would yeah, add Bob, is, is that we can't do anything about the Congo or any other place on the planet here in America if we don't lead and if people yeah. don't take us at our word. Yeah. Uh, in 2015, we crafted the Paris Agreement that brought the world together. Since then, according to a study from Yale and Columbia recently, the United States leadership on climate metrics, climate-related issues, has gone from about 15 to 101 hmm. uh, globally. That's not so good. That's not a lot good. of people are going to uh, yeah. listen to your desires if you're at that level. Yeah. Good news is, with the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, 
We just sent a signal, a signal to the markets that we're in the business of clean energy in this country mm. again, uh, and a signal internationally that the United States is ready to lead again. Mm -hmm. We got to get the House to pass it this week, mm -hmm. uh, but we're on the right direction. On the right track. Greg, if I could, I could just yeah, add to please, that. Yeah, please, Robert. Uh, diplomacy, as you said, is so important in this. Uh, continuous and robust engagement is such a powerful tool. Um, because as been said, you know, we can't just tell these countries you have to, you have to change because the climate demands it. They have to be part of the solution. They can't <coughs> just be spectators. And the way we do that is by getting them in the room, getting them in the dialogue. Every country on this planet has an opportunity to contribute to the solution, not just by maintaining their forests, that's certainly part of it, but proactively by being part of this technology revolution, by being part of the job growth that comes with this $44 trillion. Mm -hmm. And getting them in the room, in the conversation, is how they learn uh, where those opportunities are, where those projects are, and, and how we can kind of bring them into the tent, so to speak. So speaking of that kind of awareness and education, the Secretary of State has a clean energy, energy core. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Secretary of Energy has a clean energy core. Oh, it was yeah. the Dutch state. Yeah, Secretary, Secretary we, we have okay. a Department of Energy, Clean Energy Core. Okay. Uh, it's primarily domestically focused, um, but this is a, a direct result of the BUILD Act, uh, and okay. it'll, it'll continue to benefit um, from the Inflation Reduction Act. But uh, we are creating thousands of jobs in the United States in the federal government. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the private sector is a, is a great place for veterans. There's tons of opportunities, but I think for some of us, uh, staying in government has been a really mm -hmm. natural fit. Um, so we're, we're hiring scientists, we're hiring engineers and all the things that you think of at the Department of Energy. Um, but we're, we're also hiring people like me, social scientists, um, that, that, that don't know uh, the intricacies of biochemistry. Um, but you know, we need HR people, we need <laughs> admin people, we need project managers, people that know how to organize and supervise a project. Um, so there are tons and tons of opportunities uh, for, for veterans to kind of come and, and stay within the government family and really contribute to the solution. Yeah, and get points for being a veteran. At a point, you get, you get all sorts of points direct to retirement. All sorts of points. <laughs> um, hey, Zara, let me, let me turn it back to you with regard to uh, carbon catcher, capture and specifically converting carbon emissions, what, what Lance Attack does. What does the Inflation Reduction Act mean to you from that perspective? So, so I think part of what it's doing is allowing for that diversity of options, right? It's not one option for biofuel now. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of options for a lot of sustainable fuel. And so it's giving a lot of companies options. And it's giving bigger companies options to work with smaller companies to, to bring those options to fruition for, for them as well. So it's, it's, it's really making incentives available to a wider range of, of industry people, but it's also linking, right? We will be, the second hydrogen is there, we're there. We, we, will, we happily utilize hydrogen because we, we, our organism converts hydrogen and CO2 to ethanol. Simple as that. And so as soon as hydrogen infrastructure is in place, we will be the first to accept those streams and make something with it. Hmm. And so I think it's really excited, exciting for a lot of ways, the sustainable aviation fuel incentives and a lot of the carbon utilization. I would challenge carbon transformation is what we do. It, we take carbon that's CO2 and we turn it into products. Um, I think CO2 shouldn't be thought of as waste. I would argue that it's, it's a domestic feedstock that we can now make valuable products from. Um, and so this, this, this act is, is really enabling all these options to come to fruition and not just based on faith, based on incentives, which hits the bottom line, which actually moves things. Because it, it might be the right thing to do, but if yeah. it's not gonna make you money, are you gonna do it? So it's bringing that forward. It's and we do have people that are not scientists that work here. Everyone's picking on me. We have all the other jobs too. We, we all aspire to be here. <laughs> Uh, Josh, I'm turning over to you a second. I, I just want to follow up with it. For those of you who were in the room last night for Farm Free and Die, you know, we heard something very similar from the farmers, yeah. turning carbon into a cash crop. That's right. Right? But, but it's got to be regulated. It's got to be monetized. It's got to be predictable. It's got to be all those things that, you know, market factors will make it. Yeah. And it's currently not. And that's where government policy comes in. So. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, you know, the 
um, soils management is another amazing opportunity for us. Sure. Soils management. Uh, so, soils management. So looking at our agriculture, I mean, we're, you know, we, we have a huge <coughs> agriculture industry, right? Um, and we can use that in a very positive way, not just for food security, but also to look at emission reduction and carbon storage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, all of these things, using science, mm -hmm. um, it's not just, we, I think in the past we, you know, we were consumptive in a way um, that was wasteful. Mm -hmm. We didn't really think about it because we didn't have to. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading uh, uh, the Lewis and Clark book, um, mm -hmm. uh, Undaunted Journey, uh, uh, yeah, Courage, thank you. Um, and you know, it, for those of you who read it, you know they're they're out in the West and they shoot a buffalo and eat its liver and then they leave the rest of the buffalo. Right. Um, yeah. And I thought, how wasteful, right? Because, right. but there are all these buffalo and right. this is the part we wanted. And they'll keep coming. Yeah. And they're yeah. you know as far as you can see, right? Right. Well, we have to start thinking about how we use the whole buffalo. Um, Great metaphor. And we can do that, and the stuff that Zara's doing. Yeah. Um, some of this kind of really yeah. creative uh, agriculture work, these are all things that we're great at innovation in this country. Yeah. We are really amazing at innovation in yeah. this country. Yeah. And we are going to solve the climate crisis through dedication and innovation. If we're incentivized to do it. Well, we have to. We actually don't have a choice. It's existential. Right? Yeah. 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 So, um, any other questions out there before I turn to another one? Yes, sir. Why don't you go to the mic right there? Perfect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks for uh, speaking. I, could, I just wanted. Could you introduce yourself? Oh yeah, you? I'm. Uh, my name is Zenon Arendovich, uh, the former uh, Navy nuke. Uh, now I'm looking for a job. Anyone hiring? Hey. <laughs> 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 Look at the uh, hands go up in the room. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. No, I was uh, I, I was really interesting on what what Josh had to say. How it's kind of like this important issue and kind of some of the issues that I was noticing. I'm a big proponent of solar, like solar. Uh, one of the things I I remember reading is that we don't have really a uh, a disposal or a recycling method, or and that's not necessarily included in the cost. Uh, does anyone have any any thoughts or input in into that and how that's going to kind of shape? I kind of wanted to ask Raj uh, the the about it because he was describing yeah. like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna do all of these things, but like, yeah. what happens once they reach end of life? You know, yeah. like with Dominion Energy and, and the offshore wind farms, like like those have a limited lifespan before they have to replace the uh, the propellers. Turbine? Uh, Turbines? Turbines, sorry. <laughs> blades. Blades. Thank you. Is Thank blade, you. Blade the right word? Blades. What's that? Blades. 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 Wow. Yeah. The turbine blades, yeah. Cool. And so that is actually part of our total cost estimate that we've had to develop. And so Siemens Gamesa is the uh, manufacturer, and they probably about now. I don't know, four or five months ago, made a very significant in, uh, announcement about investment that they're going to do in the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. Hmm. They're going to build a blade, the first blade manufacturer facility in the United States. That's great. Um, nice. Europe, you know, certainly has tremendous offshore wind capability right now. They've been doing it for years, and that's where this technology typically resides. Um, but as there have been just two new uh, offshore leases in the North Carolina uh, area in the last two to three months, and then the one that we're developing, and then also up in the Northeast. This is a market not just for uh, climate security, but for economic growth and security. Um, <coughs> we know that this is gonna stimulate jobs, stimulate uh, the economic development in the um, mid-Atlantic region. And so, um, you know, how will we produce, install, maintenance, and then uh, recover mm -hmm. the blades? It's a full life cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of the additional um, jobs and um, support 
that goes into that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, that is something that Dominion is, is very excited about because we know that this is not just a, um, you know, bid to improve how we provide uh, clean, re renewable energy to our customers, but it's also um, a way that we can um, put jobs into the communities in which we serve. Yeah, here, here. So it's, it's a great question. Great question. Uh, and, and fortunately, w companies like Dominion and others are thinking about this. Uh, and the good news is we have the time to think about it, whereas we're still trying to figure out what to do with waste from other energy sources like nuclear, like uh, oil and gas and other industries that uh, we also need to address. Yeah. Which is probably more expensive. Yeah, yeah. But DOE is investing in this, and that's part of that that advanced research. Okay. Is to figure out how to make the panels, right. um, recyclable. you know, recyclable or reusable, or pull things out of them, or maybe replace the panel with a better technology that's much more efficient. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks Thank guys. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Drew, let me uh, let me follow up with you and ask you how the Russian invasion of Ukraine has affected Dominion Energy. Right? In other words, what we've seen front and center is that it's a global energy market. What happens in Ukraine, the Black Sea, affects us, affects their world countries. How is it affecting Dominion Energy, and what are you guys doing about it? Well, I think that what we've seen is the you know, increase in uh, price of natural gas has certainly mm -hmm. been a factor in how we uh, control affordability for our customers. Mm -hmm. um, but Energy independence, uh, as has been spoken, um, is not just uh, good for the economy, but it is vital for national security. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I think from Dominion's perspective, we see the ability to you know, provide, obviously, a significant resource to customers, but we also see a way to serve the, uh, the communities that we live in mm -hmm. and also stimulate um, and provide more security uh, for our nation. And so those are, you know, kind of small, medium, and large responsibilities as a, uh, as a company. And we take that enormously seriously. I mean, it is a very important uh, way that we see uh, our role, not just uh, as a, uh, a provider of um, energy and, and electricity. And there it is, energy security, national security, and climate security all wrapped up in one closing statement. Well done. Okay, hey, please uh, help me in thanking a terrific panel for uh, global energy and climate security. Thank you all. Thank you. At this time, we are going to break for the morning. So please be back here 1115 for the start of our next session. Uh, please take full advantage of the sponsors and recruiters lounge across from the breakfast bar. Thank you very much.
Alrighty, everybody, welcome back from break. Uh, this is normally where I would make a joke about me being the only thing standing between you and the lunch period, but we actually have a really good couple next series of programs for you. Uh, we're going to start with some keynote remarks from Richard Kidd, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment and Energy Resilience over at DOD. And then we'll move on to our second panel of the day focused on energy trade and technologies. And I think that'll draw on a lot of the good discussion that happened uh, in Greg's panel as well as the Congressman's fireside chat with Julia earlier. But first, I want to turn things over to Richard Kidd. Richard Kidd, uh, I see you in the confidence monitor. I don't see you up here. Now I see you. Uh, thank you for joining us virtually. It's great to have you. Uh, I've heard you speak before. You're a wealth of knowledge on this subject. Uh, Richard Kidd, uh, over to you. Take it away, sir. Richard, you there? It's the opposite. Normally, I have the problem where I'm on mute. I didn't think that would happen while I'm actually on stage as well, but turns out I'm just cursed in this case. You know, so as long as he can't hear us, we can play the rate the Zoom background game, I suppose. <laughs> Which, I, as far as Zoom backgrounds go, this is actually quite good. Richard, you there? Can you hear us? It looks like you're live, so you can go ahead. It sounds looks like there's some audio problem, so you can go ahead and start, and we'll see. All right, so let's do an audio check. How about the handsome gentleman in the black blazer? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. I can hear you. I don't think right. you can hear us, so we're just going to get started. I cannot hear you. But get started. Thank you to Maya in the control room for actually just getting us moving. That is okay. He was giving you the go-ahead to start, and um, we'll start from there. Okay, great. Uh, hey, good morning, everyone. This is Richard Kidd. I, I'm not sure if I got an introduction or not. If I didn't, it was probably probably the best one I've ever had. So I appreciate the, the chance to be here this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for, you know, either your service, your support for veterans, uh, or your recognition that energy, you know, is in fact a national security issue. So I want to just deliver a few 
short remarks uh, to, to kind of give you a flavor for where we are in the Department of Defense around issues at the macro level around uh, energy resilience and energy security. So first of all, uh, I mean, if you've heard our secretary, our deputy secretary speak, you know, climate change is the context, right? Climate change will be affecting the department in all that we do going forward. And in fact, we're already experiencing the effects of climate change right now. We have it in three dimensions, operational demands on the force, all right? The force is doing things now differently because of climate change, whether it's our operations overseas or domestic support for civil authorities. General Hokanson of the National Guard says the Guard no longer prepares for a fire season, but a fire year, all right? That's guardsmen that are fighting fires and not doing their job in terms of training for their contingency mission, all right? Second, it's affecting our installations and our infrastructure, degrading our ability to conduct training, uh, and degrading our, uh, uh, our infrastructure through flash floods or drought. We have a very good tool, the Defense Climate Assessment Tool, the DCAT, that helps us with that. I encourage you to take a look at that. And then finally, in terms of our of effects on our personnel and equipment, a few weeks ago in, in, in Europe, the uh, you know the, the the runways were so hot the aircraft couldn't land. We train a large number of our Marines and soldiers in South Carolina and Georgia. All right, if you look towards the future. Our CAT 5 heat index days will go uh, above 50 and close to 70 days per year. Those are days you really can't train Marines and soldiers to do what they need to do outside. So uh, <clears throat> real effects on equipment and personnel. So climate change is the context, but let's take the national defense strategy. So the one that's published and the one that's going to be published have two consistent themes in them. So the, the, the current uh, previous the previous administration's national defense strategy had two resounding themes that are relevant. First is that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. We know that our adversaries have the ability to reach out and touch us at home through disinformation, through kinetics, but also in cyberspace, and that one of their key targets is our energy grid. The utility industry is arguably the most uh, cyber attack industry in America. Every day, our utilities do a terrific job of keeping the grid up and running, all right? But the, the, the threat to that grid will only increase in the event of a, of a conflict or a high level tensions with adversaries that have the ability to go in and, and affect that grid. The department recognizes this, and we've been undergoing some significant changes in our energy resilience conservation improvement. So ERSIP, is a, a military construction account. Uh, two years ago, it was $130 million. This year, it's $600 million. Next year, it's gonna be $750 million. That vast majority of that money will be spent to build energy secure microgrids along a prioritized list of installations. The primary mission chain of the buildings and facilities in those installations that are required for that installation to do whatever it needs to do, whether it's launch bombers, launch paratroopers, uh, have satellite communications, produce key munitions, all right? So this will be arguably the largest and most focused microgrid effort in the country. Both Bloomberg New Energy Finance and Navikin have predicted the Department of Defense will be about one third of the microgrid and large scale battery storage market in America for the next seven to 10 years. And we are working hard to prove them right, all right? so. So that will be the foundation of the department's uh, efforts. And for those of you who have worked on microgrid activities, you know, in the past, some of our microgrid activities have been three to five to six million dollars in scale. The ones that we're doing now are 35 to 60 million dollars in scale. And some installations, we're gonna make that investment, that, that level of investment two or three times in a row. So a couple of years running. So it's, a, it's a orders of magnitude larger than anything that we have done in the past. So <clears throat> this is our recognition that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary and that we need to build energy resilience across our installations. For those of you who may be interested in performance contracting or building design or whatever the case may be, that's a still a very viable tool. ERSIP doesn't replace it. In fact, it makes those other tools, uh, 
performance contracting, power purchase agreements more valuable, all right, because we, the department, are absorbing the cost of that connective tissue and making the other activities additive without embedding that cost into the third party findings. So the other thing that the current national defense strategy got right was this, was actually calling out China as a competitor, all right, as a strategic competitor. So Secretary Mattis and company did a great job on that. It's still, it's going to be in the next one whenever it's finally released. This recognition that China is a competitor in all things, but particularly China is a competitor around energy and energy technology. So, you know, I know this is the Atlantic Council, and I hate to call out one of their, you know, one of their colleagues in the think tank world, but just two days ago, the Wilson Center had a symposium, and some of us in the Pentagon, there's Pentagon staff that go to all the think tanks, and we get exomes, executive summaries of the proceedings. So just a couple days ago, the Wilson Center said that China is very clear. Clean energy technology offers a geostrategic advantage, and they are all in, all right. So if you look 20 years ago, China had practically no clean technology, all right. They have, through a variety of means, state subsidies primarily, and it's very strong demand signal. They're the largest producer of wind turbines. They're the largest producer of batteries. They're the largest producer of solar panels, all right. They are moving aggressively into power management and energy control systems, whether it's, you know, Huawei on telecoms or other sort of SCADA devices that are on the energy products that we need for the clean energy transition. China is very clear. They recognize, and I've repeated this in a number of my presentations, the country that wins the race to the clean energy future wins, all right. And they are competing, and they are competing hard. And that's why, you know, the bill that recently passed a series of the bill on inflation reduction is so important. You take that and you combine it with earlier actions where we're using authorities around Defense Production Act to start to shore up American supply chains. And you can take some satisfaction that the United States as a country is now competing, all right. For too long, we had this sort of false political debate that, you know, we don't pick winners and losers. Well, we've sort of, for a long time, we've subsidized the loser technologies while the China has picked the winners and has strongly invested in that clean energy future. And it's time that America gets caught up. So the work that you're doing and the topics that you're going to study, sorry, my timer froze out on me. I want to just make sure I stay within my 10 minutes. You know, the work that you're doing and the things that you are going to study here today in the next few days, your discussions are critically important for the United States, helping to protect our homeland and helping us in the geostrategic competition with China. So a long time ago, I was a teaching assistant for a college professor, Paul Kennedy, who wrote the book Rise and Fall of Great Powers. If you haven't read it, I'd encourage you to take a look. But basically, great powers rise and fall on energy, amongst other things, all right. And whenever there's been an energy transition, whether it's being able to harness sail plus compass, you know, plus the ability to do charts and navigate, you know, that grew the great, you know, England and Denmark and the Dutch as sort of early great powers, then harnessing coal, oil, nuclear power. So to remain a great power, we clearly have to move rapidly and aggressively towards the new energy frontier, clean energy technology. And oh, by the way, when we do that, circle back around, it will help us to mitigate the greenhouse gases that are contributing to climate change, which is, you know, the context, the existential threat that we as a nation and the Department of Defense as a military faces. So I encourage you in your work. I encourage you as veterans. I encourage you as supporters of veterans. I would just like to say that there is a direct connection from what between what you do and our nation's national security. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I wish I could take questions, but I cannot do the technology. Although if someone, I guess someone could put a question into the chat, you wanted to bounce to the moderator. Otherwise, I'll accept the limitations of technology and wish you well. All right. Well, thank you, Richard. I don't know if you can hear us still, but 
we thank you, and judging by the confused look on your face, you may not be able to still hear us. But uh, thank you, everybody. Let's give a, a, a round of applause for Richard. Uh, at the very least, you can maybe see us applauding while we're on Zoom. I, I think the, this is a, I mean, Richard's remarks and the conversation we had earlier today, you know, sets up a really important nexus of discussion around trade and technology that is perfect for this next group of panelists that I'm gonna bring on, on board in a little bit. This, this panel is titled Energy and Energy Technology and Trade. Uh, it's brought to you by our partner, National Grid, is a fantastic sponsor of this effort. To that end, I'd like to bring on Autumn Brown, Senior, Pro Senior Procurement Manager at Terra Power, Joe Ibrahim, Senior Director of Engineering and Construction at National Grid Renewables, John Munkin, uh, a Principal at Converge Strategies, and Ben Richardson, Energy Portfolio Director at the Defensive In Innovation Unit. Let's give them a round of applause before we get started. So to kick things off, I, I'm struck by the tenor that suddenly trade has, has taken around the deployment of clean energy technologies. We're talking about uh, supply chains and the resilience of those supply chains, access to those supply chains, um, all of which are core parts of the trade agenda, but nonetheless critical to you know, getting these clean energy technologies from the lab desk into, into the local communities they're designed to serve. And I think on this panel, we have four extraordinary perspectives on that nexus between technological development and trade. And so I'd like to turn to each of you kind of one by one for some initial reflections on where do you see your particular company or organization fitting within that nexus between trade and technology? And Autumn, I might start with you. Terra Power, uh, you know, a innovator in the nuclear energy space, mm -hmm. right? Uh, on the cusp of some of both the innovative technologies that are gonna shape the nuclear, the nuclear industry for the foreseeable yeah. future, but also on the cusp of the supply chain right. risks that, are, that come with that innovation. Right. Right. How do you think about this relationship between trade and technology in order to get your reactors out into the world? I think we would definitely have to rely heavily on the Department of Energy um, uh, with this Russia crisis uh, or invasion of Ukraine. Um, that has changed our strategy from, uh, you know, going to Russia, procuring uh, HALU from Russia. Um, so, um, you know, reliance on DOE to help build the supply chain um, for the production of HALU is, is essential to our success in um, deploying our advanced nuclear reactors, even with this demonstration, um, the ARDP. Um, award that we received from DOE um, last year. Um, we need fuel for our advanced reactors. And uh, uh, so uh, the government's help with this new inflation bill, uh, I think will, you know, get us, you know, that, that those investments and the, uh, the support we need to, to build that supply chain. Joe, I might turn to you next. A, a similar question. National Grid Renewables, obviously, you're not in the nuclear space, you're in a, a wider range of, of power generation products. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, your supply chain risk, your trade concerns are also you know, quite broad, have that breadth. How do you think through this issue, and also strategically speaking, how do you manage the breadth of those supply chain concerns? Yeah, so I mean, our focus is on the deployment of utility scale, wind, mm -hmm. solar, and energy storage, so that, that takes a lot of different resources. Um, so I think from our standpoint, <coughs> the i guess the continued motivation around maybe moving away from what we consider to be conventional energy resources to more renewables and and what that means at least domestically for the agendas around manufacturing and mining and so again you know what materials do we have what capabilities do we have you know within our borders to ultimately produce the goods needed mm -hmm. to be able to, to deploy that so that's that's kind of the the battle we're in right now. So, you know, so much of what the industry that, that I'm focused in requires from the globe, right, globally, especially when it comes to raw materials, that, that's really one of the big challenges right now. I think domestically as well, just the strategy around our grid and continuing to improve the capabilities around getting transmission, so getting the energy from where we can, you know, deploy it um, back to then the load centers. So both, both kind of key things right now that, that we're trying to manage priorities around. And John, Joe mentioned the grid, so I'm gonna to turn to you next, because I know that's a particular uh, area of focus for you at Converge, but also at Converge, I know you're, you're able to take, you're 
you have this kind of wider, uh, you know, 3,000 foot view of what's going on in this yeah. space. How do you see this nexus of clean energy technology deployment and, and growing supply chain dependencies around that deployment evolving, particularly from a, you know, from a national security perspective, but yeah. also uh, from, a, from a foreign policy perspective as we look to deploy and export these technologies abroad? Yeah, I mean, I think w where we find ourselves right now is kind of the, the old school elementary school word problem. A train leaves Chicago at 45 miles an hour and another train leaves 30 miles an hour in St. Louis. The problem is we didn't have the variables plugged in. We had the words for the word problem, but we didn't actually have the variables that we needed to understand where these supply chain dependencies were ultimately going to manifest. Yep. And people had information that could fill those variables. And now I think with the IRA, first off, it gives the level of predictability that I think a lot of people have been lacking about. What is policy going to do or not do to be able to support this? What level of investment is appropriate so that people don't find themselves over investing in particular areas that are not economically viable because of a changing policy environment? But to your point, as we see the pieces come together, right now there, there is a literal sense that if we look at it from a national security perspective and s apply the same word problem but look at it inside an installation, inside the fence line of a, a DOD installation and outside the fence line of how the private sector and utilities are trying to address it. Right now, we're still in a, a, a challenge where we don't know when those trains are going to meet. Yep. And I think what we really need to do is take a more holistic approach of saying we can anticipate where those supply chain bottlenecks are most likely to occur and what we can do to address them. But there needs to be better joint strategy to identify how we get there, right? So the demand signal that comes from the national security imperative of installations from the Department of Defense from thought leaders like Richard on, on how we're going to get there, need to be able to marry up to you know, the, what technologies we're pursuing, mm -hmm. what types of solutions are out there to be able to get us there, so what's reasonable, what's viable, what's going to be effective. Um, and I think facilitating conversations like this are essential to trying to figure out what those little pieces and parts are so that we can plug in those variables. You beat me to the punch and mentioned the IRA, but we're gonna table that for the next round of questions. Great. I, you know, I wanna turn to Ben. Uh, bring in the, the defense angle here, you know, DIU, you're on the cutting edge of, of building some of these technologies, but your exposure to your interest in the trade space is, is equally as great, because ultimately you want to see the, the work you're doing deployed into the field, and then you also have exposure to the supply chain necessary to, supply chain inputs necessary for those technologies to succeed in the first place. How do you think about this nexus of trade and technology, and, and how is DIU kind of moving forward uh, with, to meet, you know, the, the clean energy goals set by the broader department. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's great following Richard because, you know, I'm, I'm the government person on the panel, so I can agree <laughs> with everything he just said. Um, Defense Innovation Unit's primary mission is to accelerate DOD's adoption of commercial technologies. So this trade and these issues we're having in supply chain impacts us because we're going after that commercial sector and that commercial sector is having those challenges with access. And I've got roughly, you know, 20 projects going on inside the portfolio right now, and, and every one of them has, you know, delays and, and uh, um, cost uh, issues right now due, due to supply chain related issues. Um, and that it really works against our thesis at DIU because by engaging the commercial sector um, versus tr some of the traditional players in the defense sector, you know, we're, we are looking for things that are faster, cheaper, and better. Uh, so we're, we're kind of running up against that. Um, we have a number of projects in the, in the uh, battery you know, you know, arena, uh, some direct, some indirect, and, and obviously you know, some of these things are coming up with supply chains and raw materials. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Richard, I don't think he, he talked too much about like the, the Defense Production Act and the, and the money that's being put there. So even before the IRA, you know, there was already a, a, um, a presidential uh, directive on uh, using Title III in the de uh, Defense Production Act to, to, to get, get at those raw material piece of it. So we're working on those types of issues to help accelerate. So it's an interesting element for DIU because um, the uh, kind of where we sit in the supply chain, we can work on projects that are looking at new technologies too you know, find some of the raw materials and work on some of the supply chain issues, mm -hmm. but we're also working on very mature projects that are being directly impacted by lack of access to some of those uh, raw materials. I think, I mean, again, you mentioned the DPA, another area I want to hit on later. Uh, I also think it's worth mentioning, again, uh, the Congressman mentioned, you know, and we just saw the President sign the CHIPS Act, which is another a huge piece of, while we tend to get caught up in the raw materials piece of the, of the clean energy technology supply chain, semiconductors are equally as necessary, you know, to power any sort of electronic that we're looking for in this space. So I might, you know, turning back to turning back to, to Joe and Autumn, I might kind of ask you both to reflect on kind of this, this sea change in the policy space we've seen over the past week, week and a half, 
from you know, the, the surprise that we saw with the Inflation Reduction Act and what that means for your respective businesses and, and the trade and supply chain piece. But also, I think the CHIPS Act here is also worth mentioning because I know that plays a role in both of your technologies. I might go in reverse order, go to Joe first and then Autumn. So the, I guess from what's on the table today, and you know, maybe we, we can look at it at from, from two parts. One is the certainty you know, around the, the, the tax credits and things like that, that drives some value um, you know, with, within the, the areas that, that we try to, to, to deploy. Um, you know, there's definitely gonna be, I think, some positives that, that come out of it is from, a, from a certainty standpoint, extending you know, the, the number of years associated with that. Um, but it also then, you know, provides a little bit more complexity around, um, you know, some of the conditions, mm -hmm. you know, with that. So, you know, again, from my standpoint, if you if you look at the, the bigger picture, you know, definitely some positives there as it, as it relates to deployment. Um, but it certainly starts to provide some complexity within it, um, and in all the different, you know, areas that, you know, whether it be again from, you know, local content, uh, you know, labor things like that. So if you separate that out. Definitely good for the domestic agenda, um, but when you talk about deployment to ultimately try to get to some of the other goals that, that we're trying to get to, it, it can it can provide a little bit of chaos as well. So, a little bit of little little bit of both. A little column A, a little column B. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There we go. We'll dive into column B in a bit. I think it's interesting to talk about, especially when you know Richard and also frankly the congressman spoke about you know China in a way is the, is the elephant in the room here that we're talking about. They're the behemoth in the supply chain. Uh, a lot of you know when you talk about China as a geostrategic. Uh, threat in some ways, uh, you need to actually think about, you know, an equally a strategic approach to loosening their grip on the supply chain. Mm -hmm. But first, Autumn, I'll turn to you. The, the IRA, the CHIPS Act, you know, I think we're seeing, to, uh, to Ben's point, a lot more emphasis on the DPA as kind of a quasi-industrial policy, mm -hmm. right? How does, Terra, how, does that, how does that change Terra Power's thinking, or how does that fit into Terra Power's thinking about you know, accessing the supply chains or building the supply chains necessary uh, to get your technologies uh, into the market? So I, I think it deals with, you know, um, uh, I think assessing you know, the supply chains, uh, forward looking into the future on what, because we're at development stage yeah. right now at this point. Um, so just looking to see what materials are needed um, and we actually perform assessment on a lot of our components and materials uh, last year, um, identified our number one risk. Um, with this CHIPS Act, I think um, uh, having been in the semiconductor you know, in, you know, industry when I first started my career, um, and then it moving away, you know, uh, losing, I think, domestic supply chain for those components. Um, with this act, bringing it back to the U.S., I think that lessens our risk of, of uh, dealing with counterfeit, uh, you know, uh, items, um, which, it, you know, we've implemented, I think a lot of companies have implemented, you know, con uh, you know counterfeit avoidance programs, but I think that actually um, strengthens us um, uh, domestically to, uh, you know, I guess, you know, gain, you know, reassert ourselves on the, I think, the in leadership uh, role in, um, on a global scale, you know, to be able to, Manufacture um, supply uh, uh, semiconductors um, domestically. So. Ben, I want to turn back to you quickly. Uh, you know, you mentioned that you know at DIU you're working on a lot of the, the technologies that can possibly you know resolve you know some of these supply chain constraints. Um, and I'm also struck by the fact that DoD and DIU in particular has long been a an early adopter of these technologies of, of technologies. You know, microgrids being one of them, solar being an, a, another one. Um, when you, in that way, DIU can almost be a, a, an interesting additional pillar to these public support mechanisms we're seeing emerge as the United States tries to support clean energy technology. What does your public-private partnership model look like? How do you work with the private sector uh, to you know, leverage your research, your research and your innovations to, to private markets and support companies like National Grid and or Terra Power and others? 
So for DIU, um, you know, we're kind of uh, we're supposed to make it easy to work with the government. That's our goal. Um, you know, most people do say it's relatively easy to work with DIU. Um, we still have some of the bureaucracy that comes with being part of the government. Um, we do get complimented by, by many people tell us we do, they don't think we're part of the government, so I think that's a compliment when they, when they deal with us. Um, but uh, we use OTAs, other transaction authorities, so non-FAR based contracting, uh, which is a, is a simpler, easier way to, to work. It's, it's a l really, really, literally like a blank sheet of paper from a negotiating standpoint. You don't have the 150 rules in the federal acquisition regulations that you need to go through and deal with um, for, for contracting with the government. Um, it's, it's, it's as simple as going to our website, uh, diu.mil, looking at active solicitations and responding to that. Um, five pages or less, 15 slides or less, it's really meant to be a pitch, a pitch deck type response from companies, make it very easy to kind of get in the door. Uh, and then it's a competitive down select process you know, from that where you'd actually do a, 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 what used to be in person, obviously now mostly video uh, pitches. Um, and then you know, we try to do multiple awards and then go through a, what we call a prototyping uh, phase. The real key to it though is if you get through that process and you get a, a letter from us saying that you've met all the requirements of that pr uh, prototyping uh, phase, you can get a five-year non-competitive FAR or non-FAR based contract with, with DIU or one of our DOD, DOD partners and that could be used across all of DUD and USG. So lots of success stories I could talk about uh, on that front. Um, but really, it, it is supposed to make it easier for commercial companies to, to work with, with us. Um, getting back to that thesis before about making things you know, better, faster, cheaper to work with the government. Uh, there's benefits for you know, private industry and the government on that side, but things like the CHIPS Act, things like um, the IRA, um, what's important there for us is, is, um, is, is the fact that the biggest challenge I have uh, with working with uh, private industry is, is some of the supply chain things where some of the traditional defense contractors have certain supply chains, not that they don't have their own challenges, uh, have certain supply chains that are organized in a certain fashion uh, that allows them to work more easily with the government. Uh, what the IRA and the CHIPS Act is doing is by bringing more onshoring, by looking at kind of our allies and partners that we're working with, um, investing in certain technologies will ultimately make what uh, uh, what DIU is trying to do in our outreach to the commercial sector easier and faster and better for, for, for all parties. Um, and you know, just, just like Autumn, I, I have some history with the um, semiconductors too, so uh, it's nice to see this finally starting to move forward with the CHIPS Act. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you mentioned, you know, part of your process is uh, almost that awareness of the insights into the supply chains from those, from those candidates applying to this space. Autumn, I think you, you mentioned that, you know, your work is so forward, you're, you know, your next gen nuclear technology are so forward looking, you're able to do that supply chain assessment a little bit in advance. Right. But uh, Joe, I might, I might turn to you. That strikes me as a little bit more complicated for you, do if anything purely to uh, the lack of transparency, particularly like the minerals upstream of those supply chains. How do you manage that uncertainty and, and build that really insightful vision into understanding your supply chain risk? Yeah, it's a crystal ball. Um, I bought, <laughs> bought it off of eBay. No, it's, you know, I mean, really, if you look over the, the, the short term, just over the last 15, 18 months, take, take out of it all the, the geopolitical, um, you know, challenges that we've seen. I mean, really, you know, from a commodity standpoint, I mean, and everything as simple as, you know, Suez Canal getting blocked up, right? And, and so it, it really is. I mean, you know, from our business and, and you know, again, from a, from a global standpoint of what we need to pull into the United States in order to, to be successful around, um, you know, renewables deployment, whether we're talking, you know, batteries, whether we're talking, you know, solar uh, or wind, um, you know, it's really the, the tides that, you know, and so from, from that standpoint, trying to create strong partnerships, again, both domestically and, you know, globally um, is, is important. Um, but, but again, at the end of the day, those type of force majeure events uh, are going to happen in the industry when you're back towards, you know, the, the end of it. And, and trying to, to make that execution happen. And, and so from that standpoint, it's just having some good, you know, thinkers, you know, especially, you know, in this room, we've got a lot of, of that, you know, with, with military background and, and you're trying to solve a problem that's happening in real time mm -hmm. and, and, you know, coming up with what that solution is. So, uh, and we've seen a lot of that, you know, recently and we've been able to successfully, you know, kind of, kind of move through it, um, you know, but again, when you're, you're talking about pandemics and what it did to ports, when you're talking about, you know, labor shortages on, on offload, and you're talking about some of the other challenges we've seen with logistics and things like that. It just seems to kind of be, all right, what's, what's it gonna be this week? Mm -hmm. And figure out how to move through it. So, but, but strong partnerships with those manufacturers is gonna be key, mm -hmm. um, without a doubt, so. 
it's uh, it's embedding resilience through those partnerships. Mm -hmm. It sounds like uh, John. I might turn to you again to blow this out to the almost a macro level uh, and ask you. I mean. Joe said, you know, let's put the, put the geopolitics aside for a minute, but I'm going to put them right back in. Because <laughs> I, I think ultimately when we're talking about these issues around supply chain resiliency, sure. you know, Autumn mentioned Halu, so you're talking about Russia there. For a lot of those other mineral and material supply chains, we're talking about China. And as Richard said, you know, that's the, that's the geostrategic competition at hand. We also heard the congressman mention countervailing tariffs, right, against China as part of, you know, the overall strategic calculus in terms of how we build these more resilient supply chains. That said, right, the, the amount of weight that uh, China has in the supply chain will take time to dislodge. That's not necessarily a light switch we can turn on. Sure. Off. How do we effectively uh, manage uh, building resiliency into, into alternative supply chains, right? Keeping costs you know, low while still rapidly uh, deploying these technologies in order to meet our clean energy technology goals. It's almost a, a a shift on the trilemma that Julia, Julia was talking about during yeah. her fireside chat. Well, that's a total softball, obviously. I mean, yeah. I think we're, we'll, yeah. we'll be able to crush this. That's why I gave it to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Much appreciated. Um, so I think one of the things that's last, lacking right now is that we're still taking a piecemeal approach to how we're, we're trying to tackle these strategic level issues, mm -hmm. which in and of itself is, I think, a, str a flawed strategy, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's not pointing a finger at anybody in particular. It's, that's really a collective need that we have to address more systematically. And so an example that I would point to is that when we're talking about the clean energy transition and the types of things that need to be done, a lot of it ends up happening on a one size fits one approach, right? We're gonna try and solve this problem for either this specific component of the supply chain, or we're gonna fix the, the requirements for this particular type of client or this particular type of customer or this particular type of technology. And I think what we're missing in the process of doing so is really trying to understand where the pressures exist in the constraints associated with deploying the types of solutions that we want to get out there. So whether it's renewables or when we're talking about SMRs or, or nuclear technology, right now the, the, the way that the system is, is set up, when I say the system, I'm talking about the bulk electric system in North America, it's not set up for that, right? We're, we're still taking a piecemeal approach to, to a national scale problem. So if you think about things like the, the, the lack of, of HVDC ties and transmission systems that enable a greater capability to share renewable resources that are geographically disparate, as an example, or if we have the backbone of the system that's capable of receiving the type of advanced nuclear technology that's there to really harness the true capabilities of it, those types of conversations need to happen because when you're having those conversations, you start to see these little points of pressure that exist in terms of how you tackle it. China understands, and Russia both understands, that we can't make that transition turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. They're betting on the fact that it's going to be uh, politically challenging, it's going to be economically challenging, and it's going to be technically challenging to be able to get there, and they're counting on us not taking a strategic approach. Mm -hmm. They're hoping that we're going to continue this piecemeal process of saying like, you know, play the whack-a-mole of like, let's try and fix this one problem at a time and then we'll fix this one problem at a time. And so I think where we find ourselves, and to tie it back to really the national security theme of, of what we're identifying right now, national security is a unifying principle that has the ability to focus this conversation in a productive way. Mm -hmm. So when you say all customers everywhere, it's way too obtuse, right? You're just, you're trying to fix everybody's problem at the same time. If you look at it, within the context of identifying specific national security requirements that have this dependence on energy resources, you have now taken a, a very abstract concept and put it into a very, very specific viewpoint of saying, okay, you can't solve it for everybody all the time immediately, but what if we took this and looked at what it would require from a technological standpoint, from a contracting standpoint, I'm so glad you mentioned OTAs as an example, which is this is an OTA sized problem, right? That's why that contracting mechanism exists. You use it for the Apollo program, you use it for developing a vaccines, you can use it to try and tackle an energy security and national security problem because it's timely and important. Then I think we're, we're, we're in a different spot of being able to say, not just generically what do we need to do to get there, but what can we do to support some specific energy resilience needs mm -hmm in the context of national security, we can start to, to really identify these things one at a time. And of course, I think when you say, you know, 
the national security argument can be a really strong framing mechanism, not just in terms of you know, creating the unifying for level of effort within the US government, but also to a point you were making, Joe, about the search for partnerships, right? National security concerns and, and the development of like-minded friends, partners, and allies, which we see happening on, you know, across the clean energy supply chain beyond the United States, can be an effective, uh, you know, again, framing by which to begin developing those partnerships. Joe, I, I might press you a bit, you know, when you talk about building those partnerships, who are you looking towards, both within, with, domestically within the United States, but also, uh, and that's like a tee up for, for <laughs> Ben in a way, uh, but also internationally, because I think, again, when we talk about geostrategic competition, right, it has to be a conversation of like-minded partners and allies, not something that the United States can or should necessarily seek to take China on on its own, for example. Yeah, that's, um, it, it's a good question, because I think it's, it's, it's got, a, you know, a couple different spokes kind of coming out of that. You know, one is definitely, you know, from an offtake standpoint, right? So it's it's those partnerships and and making sure that we're we're creating those, you know, as talked about earlier, whether it be with you know power purchase agreements or CNI type deals. Um, the second thing is obviously from a supply standpoint, mm -hmm. right? Um, also the installation, the experience, and and um, from you know from a, a and, and, and then I guess I would say in regards to responsible sourcing, you know, so when we talk about labor, we talk about materials that, that you know, get that, get that labor to the actual finished product. So, you know, there's a, there's a couple different, you know, talking points there. Again, from a domestic standpoint and driving to being motivated on, on the mining side, being motivated on the manufacturing side, that, that to me is a political issue, right? And, and you can see our country is extremely divided in that regard. Again, whether you talk about conventional resources, um, you know, and, and what we've utilized, you know, to date or we're trying to transition away from. And, and to me, that's one that I think is gonna take some time, you know, maybe more from a strategic standpoint, as you mentioned, right? Um, and getting people comfortable with that, right? Um, and and that, that ability to, to start to, to change the thinking around that I think is gonna be a, a big deal in order to be able to create the partnerships that are more localized, right, with, within our borders. But then again, bigger picture, um, what I have to look at from actually being able to deploy and execute on things is, you know, and it might be more tactical than strategic, but it's, it's schedule, it's timing, it's, it's the logistics, it's cost. Yep. Certainly cost is a big component of it as well. And so, you know, making sure that, that we've got a diverse yet responsible, you know, approach to, to who we're working with. Um, you know, 48 hours from now, I'm gonna be up in Perrysburg, Ohio, um, you know, in a, in a module manufacturing facility there, um, which is domestic, and that, that's a great story and, and a strong partner of ours. But then, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, some of the things that are just starting to gain momentum. We don't have that, you know, here yet locally, whether you talk about, you know, the semiconductors. And so, again, having to have those partners, you know, whether they're coming from Europe or other places, in order to be able to still deploy on, on you know, some of the goals that we have, um, you know, here in the near term. So I wanted to actually, I'm, Autumn, I'm going to come to you, but I first want to turn to, to Ben, because you nodded your head when, when Joe mentioned, you know, the strategic, the strategic vision and the tactical kind of needs that you see here. What does DI, what role does DIU play in balancing those two needs from the private sector? And then I think I want to turn to Autumn because we're looking again towards building those partnerships with a little bit more lead time. Whereas National Grid, we have these technologies now. We're trying to make sure those supply chains are resilient now. Yeah, I mean, so DIU executes on a daily basis at the tactical level with projects that we're working on with various technologies. Um, but we always have an eye on that strategic issue is because we're looking inherent in our missions like the health of the national security innovation base. So we're always trying to make our investments in, in the commercial sector, uh, working with companies, trying to move them forward with certain technologies that can help out with some of these strategic issues and, and move that forward. DUD by itself is, it doesn't have enough of a market share in this energy transition uh, to, to be able to you know, sway the market one way or another by itself but we can uh, definitely get out there ahead of things and, and, and shine the light on certain paths to, to help open some doors. Uh, we've done things on the regulatory front uh, for advanced aviation with electric uh, vertical and takeoff uh, aircraft, for example. Joby was one of our first investments, if you've heard of that company before, four or five years ago. Uh, we worked with, with, with them and you know, their biggest challenge was with the FAA, getting uh, flight hours. They couldn't get flight hours. Well, you know, if you go uh, west of the Mississippi, about half that land is the federal government land. A lot of that's military land. And uh, if you want to get flight hours there, you, 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 come, you come to DUD and, and we, we can sign off on your flight hours. And uh, Joe Ben, the CEO of, of Joby, has, has spoken to this about how much 
DIU and DOD has really helped accelerate that marketplace. We can do similar things with things like long duration storage and other things. We're not gonna move the entire market, but you know, you heard, you heard your kid talking about you know, the long duration storage and the investments we could make and the huge impact. We've got like 500 installations around the world for DOD. Um, most of these are roughly kind of size of small towns. Some of these are quite large. Think of Camp Pendleton in Southern California, very, very large ins installations. Um, we have a lot of data centers. Uh, we got a lot of hospitals, we got a lot of things. All of those could use these investments in long duration storage. Uh, you think about things like uh, Texas and the power grid issues we had in Texas. While um, you know, it, it would you know, it would have been good if we're not a drain on the grid when the power went down. We've got about 25 bases in, in Texas. Uh, it would be more ideal if we can push power back into the grid uh, dur during, the, during, the, during that time. And, and because it's also inherent to the DoD mission that we have humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, we need to be able to deploy resources in instances like that and get out there and have those vehicles that can do the vehicle to grid type, type things and take our tactical and commercial vehicles off that base and go plug into those hospitals and everything else to keep things going and keep, keep those uh, uh, localities uh, and support them. So, you know, we're not gonna, we can do individual projects and help move things along and help technologies and, and help move money more efficiently and, and, and smarter from a government perspective. Um, you know, but the big, the big strategic shifts are still gonna happen back in the Pentagon. You know, yeah. we're just this little outpost out there in Silicon Valley, you know. And give, you, so. give yourself some <laughs> little mom and pop shop. <laughs> just a little <laughs> mom and pop shop, just yeah, a little, little valley enough. in Northern California. Uh, Autumn, uh, you know, turning to you now, I think uh, this question of partnership building, mm -hmm. I think is hugely important, particularly because when you, you know, as we we discussed earlier on, you know, your big supply chain risk is, is where do we get this HALU from? Right. Uh, obviously, the major source of that HALU is now currently doing unspeakable things by invading, right. by violating all the international norms that we previously based you know, free trade upon. Mm -hmm. So when you look at building the partnerships necessary to uh, create a sustainable, resilient supply chain, mm -hmm. how is TerraPower thinking of that? And what are the considerations you're making? So um, in 2020, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the uh, DOE was authorized by the engineering, uh, what the energy, Act of 2020 um, to establish um, HALU availability program. Um, so uh, I, I think they see the need, and I, I'm getting to the point, right? That's but um, so they see the need that we don't have enough HALU to uh, on a commercial scale mm -hmm. to fuel advanced nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm we will not have you know <laughs> nuclear advanced nuclear reactors without it um uh, so uh that part I, I think that doe's developing that program um seeking out um uh those that can produce commercial scale halu um terra power is is also on the back end um helping to you know invest in those companies to uh, uh, say create more of it at the right time for us to use um, um, in, in the future. Uh, so it, it's really key, I think, developing those, those partnerships is really key to the, to the success of our program and um, uh, which is a demonstration, uh, which is you know at the demonstration um, phase, but uh, we're looking, you know, to sell those uh, those plants going forward. So we need HALU now for our, you know, project, but also going, you know, to help uh, replace, you know, our current nuclear um, technology today. So um, it's really essential. Of course. Uh, so and I want to give every, anybody in the audience who wishes to ask a question, raise your hand and uh, head on up to the microphone. Um, Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking supply chain questions, which I'm happy to do. But you know, we might not head in the most useful direction for y'all. Um, I'm interested in you know Joe and Autumn. One of the things, and actually, frankly, everyone on this panel has brought up some form of localization and reshoring. And when we talk about the supply chain, uh, that inherently you know brings up this good political narrative around job creation here in the United States, right? And I think when you're talking again, John, to your point about the national security prerogative here, the, the integration of the defense community, right, and in getting involved in that space. You know, 
we're at a we're, we're at a this convening is designed to engage that that veteran that that military you know talent right how do you how do you effectively use that talent pool which understands the national security prerogative uh, is locally based already how do you plug in those two those two pieces to work more effectively together uh, I might I'll start with I'll start with John on this one since I've been bullying him on the China question a bit. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I, it's, a, it, it's probably the most important thing that we can talk about, especially within the context of who's in the room and, and what we can really emphasize. So I think it's, it's a combination of understanding what type, we, military veterans have seen resilience in a number of different aspects from a number of different perspectives. Mine was as a tanker escorting fuel convoys in Iraq in 2004, five, and six. And you don't really have to go very far and take a long leap of logic to understand that the energy resilience of the system that we were supporting was horrible, right? It was just like, okay, let's put 505 gallons of JP-8 into yeah. a tank so that we can drive down to escort a fuel truck to get back up to the base so we can put fuel in it to go guard pipelines so that we can get the product out so that it can be refined in the JP-8 to put in the tank to bring it back up to the base. So not a great strategy, right? Uh, and we also saw that um, that was an imperative that drove a lot of innovation of trying to understand expeditionary power in a completely different way than we had looked at before. And if anybody has any questions as to whether or not this is a big deal in modern warfare, Ukraine and, and Russia is a perfect example of how they have not solved that problem. And it has been the Achilles heel of modern military is whether or not they can project force based on the availability of energy. Mm -hmm. So that's just from a messaging standpoint. But when we talk about how veterans can integrate themselves into it, they're inherently carrying that perspective and that knowledge into the work that they can potentially do in the energy field. And the most common mistake I see, I did not come to energy because I was an electrical engineer by trade, right? There's, there's nothing in my history that would indicate that I should be working in energy right now, right? But the difference is understanding that there's a perspective and a passion that comes with recognizing an imperative in a different way than just the traditional like, well, well, is there, is there a, an opportunity to be had in this particular field? Or do I have a level of technical expertise um, that just seems suited for it, so I'll go ahead and do it. I, I really wanna shift the narrative about the way in which we engage veteran communities to be able to do it, because if you take Texas as an example, the level of disruption that happened on DOD installations for communications, electricity, and water service hopefully serves as the canary in the coal mine of like, this is a really big deal. We're not ready for it right now. And, oh, by the way, if we just light up the installation like a Christmas tree and we solve, solve that problem of mission assurance, we actually didn't because 60% of the pe personnel live off the installation. All your people are out there, all the military families are out there, and all the civilians that run all of those systems on the base, they also live off base. So you're, you're not fixing the problem by just fixing it for like one little boundary. If you can take that community approach that manifests very literally around the defense communities, channel that into what we're trying to do from an energy perspective, mm -hmm. that's the value the veterans are providing to what we're trying to accomplish here because they've seen it. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think one of the other pieces of that is just as much as the veteran community is bringing in that, that real sense of the national security urgency here, yeah. uh, bringing that to a, a clean energy technology company like a TerraPower or like a National Grid actually can help DOD solve those problems and turn on the back end as well, which is equally as I mean, uh, whether that be de for deploying an SMR or something like Project Pele, right, to electrify the battle space, we can yeah. get into that. That's a, that's a whole other conference, not just a sub question of the <laughs> panel. Right. But I, I think I want to turn, I want to give the rest of the panel the opportunity to ask this question, and I see a question there in the audience. So uh, let's go to Autumn. How do you think about these issues around localization, job creation, in terms of the narrative that Terra Power brings to uh, you know, the conversation on its role in the energy transition? So yeah, um, definitely uh, small businesses uh, as our focus is making sure we uh, you know, get small business particip participation. Um, I, I work for the government and um, so I, I'm very familiar with the, you know, aware that our small businesses are employing more, employ more people in you know, the United States than large businesses. So we wanna make sure we're focusing on getting them um, the resources um, they need to sustain, you know, or uh, even uh, or expand their, you know, their uh, capacity um, through, you know, make, 
you know, connecting them with um, the, the loan programs that the government has, um, um, things that, you know, like that. Joe, uh, same, same question to you. You know, you're all over the place. You just mentioned, you were talking earlier about where you're headed after this conference, right? Yeah. So you're in, you're in small town America seeing this job creation on yep. a regular basis. Yep. How do you see that unfolding further as a result of this trade conversation? And again, to, to reintroduce the, the veterans component to how you think about that job creation. Yeah, I might focus on, on the back end. So actually, you know, out in, you know, out on the project. So, you know, many of our projects have at, at peak roughly four, five, 600, you know, workers on site. And so when you think about, you know, what it takes to, you know, to actually complete the installation, do it in a quality manner, do it in a safe manner. Um, you know, you know, talk about, you know, people that, that I served with that, you know, that, that are in this room. Um, you know, to me, that, that's a huge plus, knowing, you know, coming in, they've got a level of, of background of, um, you know, have, have kind of done and seen, you know what I mean, some, some, some difficult things can think on their, you know, those are the type of qualities when we talk about maybe the, the installation side, right? So maybe more on the tactical and, and actually, you know, doing it out in the field, you know, you're, you're out in it, you're, you've got your boots dirty. And I mean, you know, for a lot of us, that's, that's ultimately what we live for, right? Um, being able to, you know, get, you know, get direction, you know, get a, you know, get, get some parameters and then have to think on our feet, have to understand that it's got to be done in a quality manner. It's got to be done on time. It's got to be done, you know, in a safe manner and then making sure that, that that's how, you know, it's actually carried out. And so I, I like to look at it from that standpoint. Again, we talked earlier about the IRA, um, and, and, you know, talked about that domestic, that, you know, prevailing wage, the apprenticeship type conditions that are actually in there specific to, you know, what my, my organization does. To me, that, that's, a, that, that's a huge, you know, benefit to, to actually getting that craft trained up. Um, and, you know, from, from a veteran standpoint, again, a lot of where we are at are, are in some more of these small rural areas like you had mentioned and, and can tie in pretty well from that standpoint. So. Definitely. Yeah. Ben, I want to give you the opportunity to jump in on this question around job creation and, and engaging with the veterans, even though I imagine it's more closely tied to your public-private partnership uh, work. Right. I mean, uh, DIU, Defense Innovation Unit, we, you know, most of the companies we work with, about 60, 70 percent are small businesses. And in that category, we do work with some, you know, bigger entities. Google's one of our portfolio companies, not technically a small company. Um, but uh, we, you know, most of our awards go to small companies, a lot of veterans in those companies that, that are, are there. Uh, because they're they're innovative, they 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 are seeking those opportunities to kind of drive things forward. Like John, I was there in Iraq in the early 2000s. I remember the miles of fuel fuel line. We could have actually gone faster. We had to slow down because we had to get fuel. So the the the, the kind of those issues are you know you can look at veterans. They've been through this. Some of those innovative people in, in the world I've ever worked with, or, or the young Marines I've worked with in, early in my career, um, they find solutions. Um, and and so that whole veteran community tapping into that. Is, um, is a great opportunity. We seek that out in, in some of the, the companies we work with. Um, and on the energy side, I mean, there's a deep appreciation, I think, that was kind of what John was alluding to about the challenges with contested logistics, mm -hmm. what Secretary Mattis talked about with, you know, releasing us from the tether of fuel, those types of things, um, whether or not that's hydrogen or synthetic fuels or, or other things out there. Um, those, are, those are big areas where uh, there's a lot of reasons for, for DOD to invest in right now. And, and you know, other areas that we're very interested in and in looking at those innovative technologies around like dis distributed energy resources and stuff. I mean, that, that trend line in, in, um, in the energy sector right now is a really great opportunity for us to address some of our operational energy issues. And of course, where DOD does invest, it becomes just another demand signal for that alternative yep. supply chain activity, which again, talking about a process of loosening that grip that, uh, you know, some of our uh, more cantankerous global partners, let's say, might you know, are, are are ultimately hurting the resiliency of our clean energy deployment and economic uh, clean energy economic goals. But let's turn to our first audience question over here. Please introduce yourself uh, and your affiliation, please. Hi, thanks. My name is Laura Schmiegel. I'm a senior vice president at Orion Talent, and I have almost a follow up to that question. So thank you for that. Um, I'm moderating a panel this afternoon with um, government and. Um, training providers for veterans who want to get into clean energy and we're going to discuss um, all the issues around how to get more veterans into these jobs but we don't have any employers on the panel so my question is um, John what you were saying about uh, connecting the pain points right there's going to be this flood of new investment new 
jobs, everything else. We're focused on Interide Orion on training technicians and operators to go out and work into the field at the junior enlisted level. But it would be very helpful to know and anticipate where those labor pain points and workforce development pain points are going to happen in the industry so that we can be prepared to send the veterans where the work is needed and kind of start talking to them early about where that work's going to be needed. So how can companies like ours, how can the government providers that are on my panel work with industry, kind of anticipate those needs and make sure that we're filling them as you need them and not stay one step behind all the time? It's a fantastic question. Uh, I might I'm, I'm going to stick that with, with, with John first. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. And then we'll go, we'll go to, no, we'll go to Autumn and Joe. Uh, I remember my transition off of active duty, and it was a shit show. Pardon my French. It was a total mess, right? Trying to figure out, like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Because I thought I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, but now I want to do something different, and I don't know what that thing is. And, and trying to figure that piece of it out. Um, right now, I think the demand signal on clean energy is so strong. The hard part is, like, sorting out where those opportunities manifest and in what areas it's most compatible with the types of skill sets and the passions that people have. So I think a lot of it is focused on technical skill, and rightfully so, right? The translatability of what people are learning in the military and wanting to be able to channel that into what they do. The real question is whether or not that aligns with the passion for what they're most interested in and really contributing to. And so a couple of things that I would offer up. One, don't un underestimate the importance of non-traditional education or associations that provide at least a greater level of awareness as to what's happening in this particular space. Otherwise, they kind of find themselves on a similar like funnel that DOD provided them of like, these are the skills that you have to have. You get like the suffocation by certification and you're gonna do like all of these specific things and then you're gonna be the trigger puller that we need you to be in DOD. I think the different question is when we look at the varied needs associated with the companies that would be hiring veterans into clean energy, in the vast majority of instances, the technical piece is one only one of or it might actually not be the driving reason why they need them in there. Mm -hmm. It could be around the organizational management skills. It could be around bringing a diversity of viewpoints into an organization that has not placed the right level of emphasis on these kind of these types of issues that we're talking about in the panel right now. And so what I would really encourage you to do is, is try and find those opportunities just like you're doing here today. And or, there are so many different advocacy organizations that are trying to bridge these gaps and make sure that the right narratives are actually appearing in those discussions that are trying to capture both that blend of technical capability that they developed in the military, but also identify the passion areas that they really want to grow into. I want to, yeah, uh, Joe, I was actually thinking about coming to you mainly because you yep. mentioned you're looking for both that tactical, but also yep. that strategic kind of framing. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, the, the best opportunities coming forward is that, that, that workforce that, that likes to be out there working with their hands, right? Getting their boots dirty, putting in you know, that full, full, full day's work and coming home and, and feeling like something was accomplished. And so we talked, you know, about strategic partnerships. And you know, from from our standpoint, or my, you know, my company, we have a pipeline that we look out three, five, seven years. And so logistically, you know, where are those areas that we're looking, that we're originating in, that ultimately we're going to be building these projects? So we're, you know, we're talking about then the, the need for the boots on the ground. And and although you know, National Grid Renewables doesn't specifically hire and self-perform, we hire what, what we consider to be EPC contractors. And so if you look on Bloomberg or Wood McKenzie, what have you, you know, they'll have a list of the top 20 contractors you know, in the renewable space, whether it's wind or solar deployment. And so then you know, those names that, that are at the top of those lists, that to me, you know, whether you, you come through a company like myself and say, OK, you know, logistically, where are you guys looking at? You know what I mean? Texas, Rust Belt, you know, the Dakotas, whatever it may be. And then two, the actual contractors that then we partner with that, that you know, will be doing that, that work, needing that workforce. And, and, you know, so from that standpoint, you know, kind of creating, you know, a bit of a, of a triangle in relationship um, is, is what I'm trying to create from my standpoint, yeah. Autumn, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this as well. In a way, we're talking about, a, you know, assessing your supply chain of human capital right out 10, mm -hmm. 10 or so years. How, do you, how are you thinking about these issues in relation to that question? So, so it's, I think identifying the talent and, and ensuring that talent has the right you know, education that is needed to fill those positions. We currently have uh, tens 
you know, uh, uh, quite a few positions open now, and we can't fill people, you know, they'll fill those people because those, you know, the, the individuals I think that are applying to the job aren't necessarily um, uh, have that background or training that we need to, you know, for them to have to be able to, you know, uh, to offer them the position. So I think, to your point, is making sure that, you know, they, are, they can't, they're trained or, um, or you know, have the skill set to be able to fill those positions. Um, but also maybe looking out um, uh, on, say, SAM.gov or something like that. I mean, those are opportunities that are out there that the government has and, they're, and, and those contractors, those awardees, they're gonna need, you know, you know, just, this is just a suggestion, but uh, they're gonna need, you know, contractors to, uh, or, you know, the contractors who are being awarded these contracts are going to need employees to, you know, do the work. So maybe that could be a way to um, get those, those people in the right areas when needed. But I know for our situation, it's, it's all about, tech, you know, having the back, right background. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, and, and just, you know, I have dozens of portfolio companies that we're working with right now, most of which never thought they'd have a government contract you know, because that's kind of the model we're going after, right? And all of a sudden they do, and they see the opportunity and the growth there. So I would be more than happy to get you engaged with them because, you know, hiring veterans to kind of make that connection, help grow that business. The ideal DIU company that we work with has about 10, 20% of their business with the government. We still want them to focus on the commercial sector, but that's still a good chunk if 20% of your business is with the government and they still need to hire for people that are gonna work in those areas. And veterans would, would love that technology and, and still be able to help the mission. Thank you. Great. Uh, we got about just a few minutes left. Uh, I want to kind of do one. Oh, do we have another question? Uh, so many questions. You got a line. We got a lot. We got a There's whole. A line. That's a line, a line in the line. back. Many questions. It. All right. Uh, I thought there was a bar on that side. Yeah. Of the for a hot <laughs> second. That's next. Uh, Kevin Boer, I'm, I'm with Deloitte. Uh, question for Ben: uh, What's the expectation for you, and how do you balance between being the experimental sandbox or having to land every project successfully? Um, DIU roughly works right now at about a. 45% transition rate, which in the ecosystem of innovation groups inside DOD is really well, because I think we're averaging around 11% amongst the, the, the other players, so we're doing relatively well there. Um, definitions of transition or what's a successful project, that goal line keeps seeming, seems to move. Um, at DIU, we're starting to use the, 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 the terms of adoption, less concerned about whether or not they landed with that particular contract or that particular thing, and more about was it actually adopted and, and being used. So actually going back to the company, maybe like how many orders did you get? Um, because companies can get government contracts, IDIQs, and other things, and then actually not have any revenue coming in. So we're, we're very focused on that. We, we call companies that we work with portfolio companies because um, there's a lot at DIU where we kind of model that VC kind of environment, but we're not a VC. We're not taking equity stakes. It's non-dilutive. We're buying wares for these companies. Uh, so we're very, you know, but, but in that vein of a portfolio company, we're, we're concerned about that company's success. So we're looking at how that, you know, what regulatory hurdles are they running into? What contracting issues are they running into? What kind of growth and scaling issues? What kind of hiring issues are they run, running into? So it's that same kind of type of process to make sure those companies are successful. So you know, it, there's a full gamut of what we call success, from like you know working with a company initially and kind of moving through, uh, working with the Hill, working with the DoD budget office. You want us to start a project? Great. Have you actually funded it over the five-year budget plan that you have? Um, there's a lot of that. As you, if you've, anybody's worked with government, we do a lot of initial, like, here's a little bit of money. Well, is it in the budget for the next five years? No. Well, then just, you know, valley of death type, type stuff. So we're constantly kind of hitting it. In the energy space, it's great right now because there's such an emphasis on climate um, coming down from the White House. That, that, that's an area where, like, here's all my climate projects. It fits into a climate category. Do you want to align it with the budget that the president wants to push, put but forward? Do you ever get any pressure to be more experimental and, and um, find, find new avenues? Yes and no. I mean, it, we, we cover a spectrum of, if you know, like the technology readiness stuff of like four or five up to nine. So it just depends on the, on the technology. Um, I've got, I, I, <laughs> I literally have projects coming from electric jet skis to geothermal plants right now. Um, so, uh, I, I also have a project on a new uh, advanced aircraft blended wing body that, that just closed. So, I, I don't know what's more extreme from electric jet skis, geothermal, or, or uh, new aviation. So, 
yes, we're pushing the envelope from new technologies, but it's, it's, it runs the gamut of, of, of different things. DIU has a fusion project right now, so, which is always five years out, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. yeah. All right, thank you. There we go. Greg, you in line for a question? Yeah, I got a question. All right. Okay, uh, Greg Duque. Uh, question is for Joe. So we're talking about energy transition, right, which requires baseline energy, which requires a secure grid. Um, secure grid is threatened by climate perils. Climate perils are becoming more common and more violent and destructive. What's the National Grid doing to anticipate climate perils down the road and bake it into your capital plan? So, yeah, I, and, and National Grid Renewables is, a, is an offset of, of National Grid. Um, global uh, transmission operator out of, the, out of the UK. We have a venture arm based in the United States, and, and so we deploy their, their renewable goals um, within the, the greater picture. So from, from our standpoint, you know, National Grid, um, very similar to other, you know, IPPs and, and public transmission operators, you know, have goals from, you know, from decarbonization and, and the like, and, and so that's what, that's what we're working to deploy. The, the challenge is, is that you know, we can, we can originate a project, we can, you know, get it executed. And, and I think you're, you, you might have been referring to grid as my company versus the electric grid, I'm assuming, or were you referring to the electric grid? Referring to both. Both, yeah. And so that, that is, and I mentioned earlier, that, that's one of the big challenges is, is on the federal side and, and those upgrades, right, and, and what we're doing around that. And so right now, when you look at, at the deployment, that's probably, one of these single biggest challenges, whether you look at specific RTOs, MISO, you know, SPP, PJM, and, and you know, ERCOT and the like, um, KISO out on the West Coast, is, is that challenge right there. And getting through the cycles of, or at least what we call cycles, to actually you know, be able to, to get those interconnect agreements is what we need in order to be able to actually deploy that to the national grid, not my company, but you know, within, within the United States, and, and that's probably the biggest challenge. So we've had projects, very good projects, um, and again, with, with landowners and, and procurement line of sight and, and what have you, um, you know, even offtake, but we don't have that interconnect agreement. And so from that standpoint, that's probably one of the biggest, biggest challenges is, is, again, working back through FERC and, and the RTOs and, and trying to get that part of it cleaned up. Each kind of has their own way of tackling, you know, how they get through the studies, and everything else, um, but if you look at that backup in, in each of those RTO areas, that's probably one of our biggest challenges to ultimately meeting the goals that, that we're talking about here. So, yeah. It's a great question. I wanna, we're over time, but I wanna give each of our panelists one last opportunity, because this is a wide-reaching subject matter area where we didn't touch about anything. I, for example, thought midway through, oh my gosh, we gotta talk about cyber resilience of the supply chain and where that, that veteran's experience also from working with DOD can also be helpful, but going down the line, Ben, let's start with you. Any any areas we didn't we didn't touch on? What are your key takeaways from this session? Oh, it, it's uh, one. Thank you for Atlanta Council and, and and for letting us do this today. Um, I, I would just say any companies out there that are interested in engaging with DIU, please reach out. Energy at diu.mil um, is how, how you find us. It's as simple as that. Um, and uh, you know, just think of us as kind of a market maker. Where we we are out, we're reaching out to our DUD partners about the challenges they're facing, or reaching out to the commercial industry about what solutions they have. And then, and then we try to make something happen from a, um, a solicitation and, and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. so. John, any final word? Uh, thanks, I wanna echo that. Thanks for the opportunity to have this discussion because honestly you don't, you don't really get a chance to mix it up this way on a regular basis, but it's so important that we do so. And w what I would really say is just making sure that you're, you're identifying and taking advantage of the opportunities to put this, really apply this lens that we've talked through today on a regular basis, not just as like an academic exercise to be able to do it, but really apply it in the context of, of how we approach our respective roles throughout this value chain that we're trying to identify here. So I think if you do that, we'll find a lot more common ground than we've been able to find right now where it has to be about winners and losers within our own processes and between our own companies. I think this is where we're gonna find common ground. So thanks for the conversation. Surely. Uh, Joe, any final thoughts? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be a part of the conversation and, and the, uh, the room here today. Um, from, you know, from our standpoint, we've got a lot of great thinkers here, a lot of great companies represented. And again, when you talk about renewables deployment, 
it, it actually has a very high cost of production, both monetarily and from a resource standpoint. And so solving some of those problems, whether we're talking about raw materials or then we're talking about the process to actually get those manufactured in, into the goods that, that we then deploy, um, you know, that, that I think is one of the biggest opportunities is to kind of help decrease that, that cost of production. Nope. Any last thoughts? No. Uh, thank you for having me. All right. Well, hey, I've uh, managed to steal four minutes and 30 seconds of your lunch break. Uh, so I apologize for that. But it's quite frankly nice to have a panel that, that was talking back to me, uh, unlike, <laughs> unlike because they're in person and not on a camera. Um, first off, a, a big thank to our expert panel here. They carried a whole lot of weight for us on this substantive issue because it is so broad. Uh, let's give them a brief round of applause. Um, and then. By way of run of show, we'll be breaking uh, for lunch now. That's being served out in the, uh, the main lobby area. We will reconvene here at 1.30 sharp for our next round of fireside chats with uh, Julia Piper and David Livingston, senior advisor to uh, the special envoy for climate change, John Kerry. So with that, I'll leave you be. Thank you. <laughs>